And now, stand-up community subscribers and listeners from around the globe, it's time to Stand Up with Pete Dominic, where we ask the important questions that impact you, your family, and your community. Yeah. Such as, could a new variety of dermatological soap finally help deal with my horrible, irritating skin disease? Oh, dear. And will my updated Zoom security features be available in time for the next COVID spike and also for showing off my new shirtless dance moves? Oh, yeah. And now, the podcast host who would take his dad to Vegas on his birthday as long as everyone going is bald, Pete Dominic. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Pete Cole, and welcome to Stand Up. And if you're listening on Monday to Monday and August, it is August 2nd. I am happy to have you here, and I do have to tell you, Pete. My dad hates Vegas like his son. We're not Vegas people. No offense to Cassie and who else lives in Vegas. I'm, who else am I thinking of? Sheila in Vegas? I'm trying to think of other listeners, subscribers that listen out there. Love you guys. Greatly appreciate you listening. I'll, I'd love to come visit you, but I, I just don't understand that city in the middle of a desert. Anywho, I can guarantee my dad and I aren't going there unless you're paying, ladies and gentlemen. Then we will make an appearance for a price. Chisel D and Chisel Son. It was his birthday over the weekend. My dad celebrated 77 years with us, the whole family. It was awesome. Well, my brother wasn't there, but we're going to get together with him this week for the first time in a long time. Feeling good as I'm starting off this Monday. Supposed to be taking vacation next week. Supposed to be meaning I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to vacation my mind and actually doing it. Val and I are taking the girls or really Val's taking us because she's working the whole week teaching yoga at this resort so that it's cheaper and and, and more affordable and have not taken time off since I really started this not like a solid week away from the show so I'll be pre-taping shows though for next week interviews at least so I hope to air at least one a day maybe there'll be more it depends on who gets back to me and how the scheduling works out this week but if you've got some last minute requests who you'd like to hear on next week's program let me know programs but I'll be taking the week off but the show won't be it should be up hopefully I'll get it done this week it is a one man band I produce the show entirely I book it with all my favorite people let me know who you want me to have on of course, I prep and host the interviews and the news producing and editing that every night. And then, of course, posting it. The graphics, all of it with help from listeners like Pete Coe and Johnny Carroll and Dan McDonald. And, of course, my friend CJ and so many others who have helped me along the way to make sure that the show happens every day. Can't do it without your subscriptions, though. Got to have them. Please sign up right now. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or just go to the paid subscription link in the show notes. Awesome guests. Great conversations with both my guests on today's program. Dr. Brian Rosenwald of the University of Pennsylvania talked sports and men in our relationships with them in the Olympics. He talked about politics. He is a historian and professor at University of Pennsylvania. Always great with Dr. Brian Rosenwald. Really enjoyed that. And Maura Quint, it's Maura Mondays, had an awesome conversation, another really great one with Maura, and she was hilarious and brilliant. As always, we talked about aging women, what it's like to be a woman who's aging. We talked uh, We talked also, of course, about her work with Tax March, which was in New York City, and some economics issues, some pop culture issues as well. Really great conversation with Maura. I think you're going to love both of my guests on today's program. I hope you had a great weekend. Happy August. I made another raspberry pie and a whole bunch more. I cucumbered. I pickled a whole bunch of cucumbers. I cucumbered pickles. No, it's the other way around. And had a great time with my family this weekend. I hope that you did. And I'm happy to have you listening. Lots of news to get to. So many stories because it's Sunday. News galore. Headlines and more. Time to get to the last 24. Well, unfortunately, the big story over the weekend seems to be not only, obviously, the Olympics going on in, in Tokyo, but all things COVID and COVID related. Here's the, the headline, the bad news that a lot of people are uh, certainly focused on. In the last week, COVID-19 hospitalizations in the U.S. have doubled. The CDC predicts deaths will rise in 43 states over the next two weeks with almost 5 million people getting vaccinated in the last 14 days, 
fear of Delta variant appears to be motivating the a motivating factor. So that's the good news. More people are actually getting vaccinated. The White House Chief of Staff, Ron Klain, noted that U.S. has administered more than 700,000 COVID-19 shots for four consecutive days for the first time, quote, in a long stretch, while data indicates more American adults are receiving their first dose than any time in the past eight to 10 weeks. He added that we are seeing particularly strong increases in the states that are hard hit by Delta. And the Washington Post, several states with low vaccination numbers have increased their rates significantly, including Louisiana and Arkansas, which have seen recent bumps of 114 percent and 96 percent, respectively. And so let's get to some of the sound on the pandemic, COVID-19, the virus that will not die here or anywhere else. Because while vaccines are widely available, you can get them anywhere. They're being delivered. There's rewards. There are incentives. Still enough Americans have not gotten vaccinated. And here we are. So let me check in with the experts for you. Play a few pieces of sound to help illuminate some of the issues and statistics, the scientific communication. A lot of criticism, a lot of criticism going on. I'll be talking with Dr. Aaron Carroll on tomorrow's or rather on Wednesday's show. So Still time to get your questions in for him. But let's first go to Dr. Anthony Fauci, who was on a couple of shows yesterday, including CBS News Face the Nation with John Dickerson in the anchor seat. And Fauci says the vaccine is doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. It's working. It's effective. Looking at the Massachusetts, the Provincetown study that was a part of this mass guidance, uh, we've talked about the ability to transmit among those who are already vaccinated. But it looks like the story of that study could also be the vaccines work. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's understandable how there could be kind of a dual or a mixed message from that study. But the predominant message is that if you are vaccinated, and you get a breakthrough in fact, first of all, if you're vaccinated, you're much, much more protected against getting infected than an unvaccinated who is completely vulnerable. So you have a degree of protection against infection. But the critical issue, John, is that if you do get infected, the likelihood of your getting a severe outcome of the infection is very low. It is much more likely that you will be either without symptoms or minimally symptomatic. So the vaccine is doing what you want it to do. It's protecting people from getting sick. So we know what the solution is to ending this pandemic. So what is the continuing problem, sir? Let me ask you about context here. In the CDC document, there was an expression, uh, someone wrote, the war has changed based on these new findings. But isn't the war essentially the same as it was, which is there are pockets of the country where there are not people getting vaccinated as much as they should be. And that's the big issue. And that that hasn't changed this week at all, despite what we've just been talking about for the last four minutes. You're absolutely correct. We have 100 million people in this country, John, who are eligible to be vaccinated, who are not vaccinated. We've really got to get those people to change their minds, make it easy for them, convince them, do something to get them to be vaccinated because they are the ones that are propagating this outbreak. So you're absolutely correct. That hasn't changed. What has magnified the problem, John, is that we're now dealing with a virus that has an extraordinary capability of spreading from person to person. So when you superimpose one on the other, you have a very difficult situation, a pool of unvaccinated people and a virus that spreads very efficiently. All right, Dr. Fauci with some insights on CBS News Face the Nation. Let's head over to NBC's Sunday show. It's Meet the Press, where Chuck Todd had Dr. Naid Badilia on, and she talked about this CDC document that said the war has changed and gave us some insight as to why certain people in certain places should probably wear masks again. And and, and I want people to hear this very clearly. What hasn't changed is that the path, forward when it comes to vaccination remains the same. Even with Delta, you know, CDC's own documents are saying threefold decrease in infections. So if everybody is vaccinated, everybody is three times, you know, threefold less likely to be infected and tenfold less likely to get hospitalized or vaccinated. And hence the path forward on the other side of this is still getting everybody vaccinated in the interim, though. It does raise this question that if there are vaccinated people who can still transmit, 
then two things should happen in high transmission areas in particular we should we need to mitigate those layers you know we got to we got to put on that mask right. we got to consider if we should be having those large gatherings and people who are high risk should consider potentially taking that extra layer of protection immunocompromised higher older uh, higher age older patients should consider putting on that mask particularly if they're in high risk areas I'm sure you still have questions, and I would be happy to try to get them answered for you. I've been getting a lot of questions and emails for, not for me, obviously, the hell do I know, but for the experts who join me here. And like I said, Dr. Aaron Carroll will join me. We're going to talk tomorrow. So if you want to get a question in, send it by uh, Tuesday at 9, I think that's when I'm talking, in the morning with Dr. Aaron Carroll, and that will be posted on Wednesday's show. All right, let me move on to another really important story that I think got kind of buried, but I did hear about this. I think my dad told me about this, actually. The Justice Department says that Congress now has the authority to see Donald Trump's taxes, and Pete Williams on MSNBC, or NBC News, rather, says, unless Trump can get this blocked in court, I think that would be hard. It looks like Congress is finally going to get Trump's tax returns. This is a long-running battle. There's a federal law that says the House Ways and Means Committee, when it's looking at whether to change the tax laws, can ask the Treasury to give them individual tax returns. They have to keep them secret. Uh, But the Treasury Department and the Trump administration said, no, we're not going to do this. There was a request from House Ways and Means, and they said, we're not going to do this because you don't have a legitimate reason to see this. You're not actually looking at legislation. You just want to embarrass the president. So, no, we're not going to give it to you. And in 2019, the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel agreed with that and said, this is, uh, this is, there isn't a sufficient legislative purpose. On second thought, the Office of Legal Counsel says today, and this opinion just came out, that's not proper, that uh, looking extremely hard at whether Congress has the justification or not isn't what the law says. And the law says if they ask for it, they get it. And so the Office of Legal Counsel concludes here, I'll read this to you, we conclude Treasury must furnish the information. So that they're saying to the Treasury Department, you have to give Congress Donald Trump's tax returns. I think it's uh, five years tax returns from 2015 through 2020. Uh, So unless he can get this blocked in court, and I think that would be hard because that's what the law says. It looks like Congress will finally get his tax returns. How about that news? I think I heard somebody, either Pete Williams or or Chuck Todd was broadcasting from home. Must be because I heard a dog at the end of that clip. Did you hear a dog? Anyway, Justice Department now is going to turn those Trump taxes over to Congress. No word on who's going to translate the taxes from their original Russian. (laughs) So somebody tweet that. And I guess he has till like uh, next week or something to to appeal this. But that's a pretty big story, a very important story to see what happens, what was in there. And, uh, well, lots of questions there for sure. And we'll learn more about it this week. And maybe I'll get somebody on to talk about it and talk about what uh, what the consequences could be here for the former disgraced president. Now, another story over the weekend was that the federal eviction moratorium has expired. The pandemic related federal ban on evictions expired this Saturday night, despite a last minute effort by President Biden and House Democrats to extend the deadline earlier this week. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi indicated she was caught off guard by Biden's call for Congress to act and was unable to co- uh, to corral the votes necessary to pass it via unanimous consent before the House adjourned for a week's long recess. The Senate was in session Saturday. They didn't address the issue, but Congresswoman Cori Bush did. She slept outside the Capitol this weekend to try to convince Congress to return while protesters gathered outside Nancy Pelosi's San Francisco home and taped a fake eviction notice to her door. According to Reuters, more than 15 million people And 6.5 million U.S. households are behind on rental payments. Here is Congresswoman Cori Bush, who I said, with along with other activists and supporters, slept outside the Capitol to try to bring attention to this issue. When you sleep outside on the ground, you are um, open and you are vulnerable to all the elements. However, whatever those elements are, it was cold last night and now it's super hot. We've still been here. I still have on the same clothes I had on last night. I'm dirty. I'm, I'm dirty. I'm sticky. I'm sweaty. I still have on what I had on last night. This is how people will have to live if we don't do something. 7 million people, 6 million, 11 million, how many ever it is, they deserve their human dignity and they deserve for the people that are paid to represent them to show up and do the work to make sure that they have their basic needs met today. 
Now, here's a quick report from CNN's Suzanne Malvo reporting on this issue. I thought this was interesting and important. She says that she will stay there until something gets done. One thing that House Speaker Pelosi and others are emphasizing is that it was $46 billion in this rental assistance. Only 7% or $3 billion has actually been spent and allocated through state and local municipalities. And therefore, they're really trying to make sure that those local governments get that aid to the people as quickly as possible. The money is there, Boris. The money is there, Boris. And now here is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Congresswoman, uh, who is the leader of the progressive, one of the leaders of the progressive movement, progressive caucus in the House. Apparently, the issue is between more conservative Democrats who wanted to go home and not do anything about this issue and more progressive Democrats and not necessarily blaming the Republicans who, of course, wanted to do nothing. But Democrats are in charge of the agenda here, and that's how AOC lays it out on CNN's State of the Union. Well, you know, I think there's a couple of of issues here. First of all, you are absolutely correct in that the House and House leadership had the opportunity to vote to extend the moratorium. And there were many, and there was frankly a handful of conservative Democrats in the House that threatened to get on planes rather than hold this vote. And we have to um, really just call a spade a spade. We cannot in good faith, blame the Republican Party when House Democrats have a majority. Now, there is something to be said for the fact that this court order came down on the White House a month ago, and the White House waited until the day before the House adjourned to release a statement asking on Congress to extend the moratorium. This came after weeks. I sit on the Financial Services Committee, which has jurisdiction over housing. We had, you know, the the housing secretary there asking about the administration's stance. Uh, We asked the Biden administration about their stance, and they were not being really forthright about that advocacy and that request until the day before the House adjourned. And so the House was put into a, I believe, a a needlessly difficult situation. Um, And it's not just me saying that. Uh, Financial Services Chairwoman, uh, Chairwoman Maxine Waters has made that very clear as well. And so there's a couple of contributing factors here. We have governors who are also not getting this emergency rental assistance out in time, which is forcing this this extension, what we would like an extension of the moratorium. The fact of the matter is, is that the problem is here. The House should reconvene and call this vote and extend the moratorium. There's about 11 million people that are behind on their rent at risk of eviction. That's one out of every six renters in the United States. Well, I thought that was important. I wanted to give you as much context as I could on that. A lot of activism happening, sleeping outside the Capitol. I would have done that if I lived in Washington. I would have hung out. I wish I lived in Washington. It's got to be a pretty cool place. I got to get down there. I'm actually going to go down at the end of August. Anyway, I I also wanted to play for you Alexander Vindman, the former White House aide who testified in President Trump's first impeachment trial. He's got a new book out and he I'll try to get him on. He details his side of the story in his book. He told USA Today in an interview. Well, listen, the kind of damage that. President Trump caused to this country and continues to cause now directly and through his proxies is far beyond anything that our adversaries could hope. And we could have been in a world where there would be four more years of Trump. There would be more harm to public servants. There would be less accountability. The erosion that we saw within the departments and agencies could have could have caused kind of the, the collapse of good governance. And we could have added up to being a completely different country. This is not an exaggeration. This is, this is 100% my strongly held belief that we could have been in an entirely different country at the end of another four years of Trump. Yeah. Ooh, I like that sound effect from USA Today. Yeah, of course. We probably, we already are a totally different country because of Trump. It would have been that much worse and it can still get worse which is why we've got to stay vigilant can't look away stay involved and find different ways to stand up in your community and let me know what you're doing all right so all right a lot more to report late sunday night the senate going into action and trying to pass this infrastructure package and uh, i didn't get time to cover that tonight for the monday show but definitely a huge story to follow there. But finally, Saturday night, I celebrated my dad's 77th birthday with Val and the girls and my mom. We had a great time, went out to dinner, and then I came home and jumped in the shed and popped onto MSNBC to talk about a bunch of issues on This Week with Joshua Johnson. Always a good time on a great panel with Hayes Brown and Anna Marie Cox. And 
I just wanted to share with you because it's my show, my commentary. I gave a little, of course, from time to time on the Simone Biles issue. And I was, well, here's the clip of Joshua Johnson asking me a question and me from the shed feeling good that the shed was on TV for all to see and couldn't do it without you guys. Here's that moment. Pete, I'm sure you heard about uh, SNL's Michael Che, who came under some fire for some jokes that he posted on Instagram, which, you know, comedians come up with jokes. They come up with jokes on every aspect of life. There are a few sacred cows in the world of comedy, but he got some flack for the things that he posted regarding Simone Biles ahead of a stand-up show that he's doing in New York this weekend. I don't know how you see this. I tend to, as kind of a First Amendment purist, believe that You can say anything that you will own the consequences for. If you will take responsibility for what you say, first line of the NBC News standards, we are responsible for everything we report on every medium, including social media. We're responsible. So I can report anything I will own. And if he's willing to own the criticism, okay, that's on you. You're free to say it. But how do you see it, Pete? Well, in- increasingly, comedians are, are more worried about their words simply if they work for, for companies. You know, of course, Che is at Saturday Night Live and, and has, you know, c- can be concerned there. But like I always put comedians, you know, these are my peers, my entire career in a different category. They're comedians. And if you don't understand that they some of them are going to go for the sh- most shocking thing they can and and hope to profit from it. That's why earlier, Josh, when, when you said, I'm not sure who the, you know, the critics of Simone Biles or why they're doing this. And Anna, you know, you, you, you're both like, you know, why would they do you? You know why they're doing it. We all know why they're doing it. And people have been clamoring to hear the point of view of another straight white guy uh, this week from me. So here That's it goes as, as, a former, as a former, a non-competitive break dancer on Simone Biles. I mean, I don't care about it's not my business, the twisties. It's interesting to hear about what that is. Her, she is is the most amazing gymnast ever. And unless you can fly, then don't criticize her, I would say. But number two, her mental health, this is such an important issue, such good news. And I think the critics are far fewer. And they're the same type of guy, they're the same type of guy who is criticizing Adam Kinziger for becoming emotional, for having emotions. They're not that many. Most people are supportive of, of, of what she's doing. I think this is really important to, to mention that the, there's been a, a real groundswell of support for what she is doing. And finally, I, you know, Sally Jenkins wrote in Washington Post, it's a perilous endeavor to try to interpret, you know, what her prerogative is. But I'll give it a shot. You know, as, as Anna so rightly said, she is one of the only member of the team who is part of Nasser's abuse, a victim of his abuse. She's got to be conflicted just working with USA Gymnastics while they're still in court trying to evade responsibility. And frankly, this is probably perilous and un, unfair. But, you know. She's a black American. There's a lot of confusion uh, about competing under that flag right now while they're trying to take black folks vote away. And I'm the white guy in the panel to say that. So I'll shut up now. And believe it or not, I did stop talking. I did. That was a long time to be talking on cable TV. I don't think I've ever talked that long, but these were longer blocks, longer segments. We did three of them on MSNBC last night. Always fun. Great exposure for me and hopefully a lot of new folks coming over and checking out the show. But that's all I've got time for in the audio, but lots more headlines to share with you right now in the news dump. How about that? Hit it, Pete. Nature walkers stroll along, blackbirds in a clump. They're pecking your friend's face on today's news oh, dump. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Pecking my friend's face. Not good. Not good at all. Run. Run from those blackbirds. Thank you, Pete. And now it's time to get to those headlines. Let me start with a happy story. This one coming from one of the greatest Americans ever. It's Dolly Parton. We found out that Dolly Parton invested royalties from the song I Will Always Love You that she made. Of course, Whitney Houston sang it, but Dolly Parton wrote it. And apparently Dolly Parton then went and invested the money into a black community in Nashville, Tennessee. How about that? Legendary musician Dolly Parton said that she invested royalties from Whitney Houston's song to a local black community in Nashville, Tennessee, according to the Washington Post. She's on Bravo's What Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen, and she told him that she used the royalties from Whitney Houston's song, rendition of her song to purchase a strip mall in Nashville so that uh, folks could interact with the black community just as Whitney Houston would have wanted. And uh, it's a great story, so you can watch that interview, read about it, 
and I thought that was a good one to start with. This one's not as fun. This is ABC News. Ammunition shelves are bare as U.S. gun sales continue to soar. A shortage of ammunition in the U.S. is having an impact on law enforcement agencies, people seeking personal protection, recreational shooters, and hunters. The COVID-19 pandemic, coupled with record sales of firearms, fueled a shortage of ammunition in the United States that's impacting impacting law enforcement agencies. I mean, geez, you can't get anything anymore. Uh, the, process, the price of everything is up, and you can't even get uh, any, you know some extra rounds, extra few magazines, clips to protect your castle. Scary times. And in Australia, it is no joke about locking down. They are enforcing one of the most severe lockdowns in the world. Recently called in the military to help enforce their zero COVID strategy under the government's policy. Rule breakers caught ignoring the latest regulations are going to be fined 500 bucks. Borders remain shut until the percentage of population to receive both vaccination shots jumps from the current measly number of 17 percent. To 80 percent, according to the U.S. Sun, where I'm reading from on Saturday, up to 1,300 police swarmed Sydney and set up roadblocks in a massive show forced to stop a repeat of last week's violent anti-lockdown protest. 300 unarmed army personnel also helping go door to door to ensure people have tested positive are self-isolating. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that happening in America? Door to door police to making sure people are self-isolating, you're going to be met by by some very angry person with a pistol in their hand asking you to uh, politely leave, cops, unarmed people, knocking at, oh man, anyway, crazy what's going on in Australia, what a difference. All right, a couple of, a couple more big stories from ABC News, forgotten oil and gas wells linger, leaking toxic chemicals, they're about Two million abandoned oil and gas wells nationwide that haven't been properly plugged with cement. It's a great article, a really important issue. Uh, I highly recommend uh, that we check this out. If you, if you know anything about this, I'd love to talk with somebody about it. This is an interesting, really big problem, but it's also a, a job creator for the, all of those wells being capped. And I think that's part of the uh, investment that the infrastructure bill is supposed to cover. Speaking of pollution, climate, flood watches in the U.S. West as mudslides close major interstate. Colorado officials said mudslides caused extreme damage to a major interstate, leaving it clawed with boulders and rocks and no word on when it might reopen. The flood risk was elevated for a lot of areas of the West where recent wildfires burned away vegetation, left hillsides more susceptible to erosion, according to the National Weather Service. And finally, in Oregon, it looks like he, uh, it's getting there's some progress. Firefighters in Oregon reporting good progress in the battle against the nation's largest wildfire. Authorities canceled evacuation orders near a major blaze in Northern California. And so that's a little bit of good news that there's containment of the bootleg fire up to 74 percent on Sunday, 56 percent just one day earlier. And did I mention that I jarred six more Ball jars of pickles and made another raspberry pie. That is the headline from The Shed, personally. And that is your news dump for today, Monday, August 2nd. Let's get to my guests now. That's the next segment of the show. And no ad read today. I am going to get to my first guest, and I'm very excited to have her joining me today and now every monday is the goal we've got finnegan fridays and more up mondays i think both these guests provide a really great perspective on a wide range of issues from culture to gender to politics and the times that we're in they're both really vulnerable and hilarious and very very intelligent and i love ending the week with christian starting the week with maura and so that's maura mondays with maura quint who is a great comedy writer. She's contributed to The Onion, Reductress, Words at McSweeney's, The New Yorker, and she's also the executive director of an awesome organization called Tax March. She was just in New York along with other organizations doing a rally last week. We talked about that. We talked about what it's like to age as a woman, the difference between men and women on that. She told me a hilarious and poignant story, and it's just, we go all over the place. It's always a great conversation. It's a feel-good conversation, and she was hilarious as she always tends to be. She's on Twitter where she's prolific. At Behind Your Back. 
And she really loves, like other guests, to hear from you. So tweet her and tell her you heard her on the show. Here we go. It's Mora Mondays with Mora Quint. And it's time for the second edition of Mora Mondays. Mora Quint joining me for the second Monday in a row. And any Monday I can convince her to. Thank you for joining me. We can look back at the week. We can talk about our lives and, and always have an interesting conversation. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm happy to be here. It's any day of the week that starts with an M. I mean, I feel compelled to be. It's, yes, it's, yes, it's I have no choice. Yes, well, uh, then this is our day. For uh, you, literally made me think if there's another one. I was like, are there any? <laughs> uh, how was your How was your last week in terms of your public part of your life? Tax the rich was in New York City. I saw you with your yeah. tax the rich mask. On what was this uh, event about? We had a big deal week last week. We launched a new, uh, Times Square billboard um, that was a tax the rich billboard. It has a giant picture of just Jeff Bezos's face on it uh, and talking about how he pays very, very little in taxes. And if he can afford to launch himself into space and take a little joyride, he can afford to pay his fair share in taxes. It's pretty straightforward. So we were there and we did an event uh, in Times Square with New York Communities of Change um, and Strong Economy for All, Patriotic Millionaires and Move On, uh, which was so great. It was so great. It was, it was so much fun. Yeah, what is it? What, what is the energy like with all of these uh, people who are super passionate about a cause? Like these are the the, the most elite of activists, of organizers, of people who deeply care about these issues. And then if you put them all together in, in one place, I bet you get a pretty positive vibe, but also a lot of good networking and, 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 and organization building. What is that like? It was super fun. We, we did this sort of event like out in the public. We were engaging people who were walking by. We had, um, we had Reverend Billy as our MC, who was uh, dressed all in a great hot pink suit and was shouting out through a bullhorn tax the rich and like getting people rallied up. But it wasn't so much the organizations that was exciting. It was the actual energy of people walking by and who were like really excited to engage on this and were jumping in. And the most fun for me was that, uh, Everyone knows the the naked singing cowboy, of course, in Times Square. He's, you know, this icon of Times Square. Yeah. You look like you don't even know. Well, you I know. know. I, I I was maybe just making that face that everybody knows. I mean, I do right. they? Everybody uh, knows. He's so, he's do, an icon. I think so. I, I don't know. I, I worked there every day, so I felt like it was part of my commute. But dude, well, stand- I'm not a New Yorker. This is so, right. I mean, like, I know this. I'm not, I'm not a New But just so in all. case anybody doesn't know, dude stands in his tidy whities and mm-hmm. cowboy boots and a cowboy hat and plays guitar. And I think he's shown up at some conservative things maybe in the past. I don't know. I have no idea. Okay, I have ahead. a feeling he does whatever he needs to. But what, uh, what I didn't know is that there is now a <laughs> naked singing cowgirl. Oh, naked. Who, she's topless, uh, but she's, I don't know how old she is. But she's she's not youthful. She's she's a more mature lady. Uh, and she was fully topless wearing her uh, like she had like, you know, little tiny bottoms on and uh, and a cowgirl hat and a guitar. And she was so excited. She kept coming over and she was like, yes, tax the rich. It was just fantastic. And especially because we had one of the uh, founding patriotic millionaires who is an actual multimillionaire who advocates for, you know, raising taxes on his class of people. And she's just standing next to him. He's got like a suit on. It's like 95 degrees and she's just shouting along. So that was fantastic. And then a bunch of the costume characters, not all of the costume characters, but quite a few of the costume characters also kept kind of wandering over and were like getting in on it a little bit. I think probably more than they felt they were supposed to, which was fantastic too. We had Iron Man, we had a giant panda and uh, not Mario. But Luigi seemed really into it. So it was super fun. <laughs> well, Mario is a is a real capitalist, and Luigi, it my, seemed it, yeah. my understanding, is more of a socialist. But he, he's got he's at least questioning. You know, he's, he's, <laughs> he's looking for some alternate opportunities here. Did anybody get? Does anybody get mad at the at the tax the rich or any of the short messaging that they see? Does anybody get offended uh, and and go on a diatribe about how they earned their money? So I have definitely done events across the country. I've had people come up to me and want to talk very seriously. They have points they want to make. No one did in this. Like there were some people who were kind of standing around the edges, checking out what was going on. And when I offered them like a tax, the rich mask, they declined. So I don't know exactly what their perspective was, but they weren't, they weren't looking to engage or like shout or, you know, have any sort of conversations. They just seemed to sort of be like, 
you know, taking it in, checking it out, you know, I don't know, getting some insight, maybe uh, that's, that's about too far. <laughs> I want to just fly on the wall of that. I also want to tax the rich mask, uh, which I'll put over my. Do you eat. not have one? I don't Did have I one. <gasps> no, we're not oh that close. Gosh. We're not that close. All right. I will send you a tax the rich mask immediately. Yeah, I'll have to, uh, to put it over my hammer and sickle mask because and... I've been I've been being called uh, a communist and, a, and, a, and I was called Stalin by my friend Paul Rykoff. Did we and I'm, I, I, I if we already talked about this last week. Forgive me, my memory of a fish, but I just basically am. I find it reprehensible to live in a society where someone, one person has so much wealth or a hundred people have so much wealth. And it's an obvious discussion with you. And I don't know how to change that, but I just, you know, I've said be, having a billionaire is, is disgusting and everybody's calling me, you know, jokingly, but whatever, like a communist, what, it doesn't matter the name calling, but what do you say to people? What is your kind of moral? Did we talk about this? We didn't talk about oh, this okay. now. So what is your response to, to someone that says, what are you going to put limits on them? Or, you know, you're a communist or like, what is your general? Well, I mean, I'm coming from a campaign right now of tax the rich, right? Like that's the, the yeah. perspective that we need to tax the rich at higher rates. The truth is we have in the past many, many points tax the rich at much, much higher rates. There's right. a, a thing I always like to point to. I got really into watching the twilight zone for a while, which <laughs> was like the 50s, 60s, basically, it ran through. And there's an episode where, uh, like, you know, genie in a bottle kind of thing, and the guy has a couple of wishes, and one of his wishes is to just be, uh, you know, extremely wealthy. And the genie grants him, like, a million dollars or a couple million dollars. And he immediately goes, all right, well, even with 90% going to taxes, I'll still have, and he was really excited about it. Because at that time, that was yeah. the that was the top marginal tax rate. It was 90%. Like, right. that was just historically where we have come from. And so where we currently are is in that has started since the late 70s, early 80s, where we have consistently followed this sort of Reaganomics scheme and been cutting the taxes on the wealthiest for over a long period of time. So... Like, you know, it's not as though anyone looks to these earlier time periods of America and goes, well, we were commies back then, but we've changed. It's not the case. So that's sort of where I tend to go with people like that, because I think they have this general idea that this is how it's always been and we can't change it. When no, in fact, we used to have it in a completely different place. We used to, to treat wealth and, and tax it much higher. But whenever we... Whenever anybody makes the, you know, the point about how rates have changed or when we talk about those rates, I, 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 my understanding is, and it's important to make clear, it's that percentage was on the money that you make over a certain dollar. So your taxes are, you know, far lower for your first million dollars or first two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I'm not sure what the brackets cover right now. And then they go up progressively for the dollar you make over five hundred. And then once you make then they start getting taxed on the billion dollars is would be much higher. Right. So it's like when people say you're going to tax, if I make a billion dollars, you're going to take 90 percent of it. That's not what happens. You're right. And when I watched that Twilight Zone, too, I was like, he's not even getting it right. right. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay. Because it is uh, the marginal tax rate means that you are paying 10 percent, say, on the first hundred dollars. Obviously, I'm just making up numbers. And then the next hundred dollars, you're going to pay 15% on that hundred. And then, you know, it goes up progressively in that kind of way. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not on the but, total amount, but I, I just, I don't know what the argument is. I'm sure they have some argument, but if Bezos, the, the argument with Bezos was he doesn't pay his employees enough and their working conditions, well-documented in many places, the Amazon warehouses and so on, the drivers, everything. And I just look at it and go, he didn't make that money. They did. All these people are making sure the products get delivered every day and then he gets money in his account every day. And why can't he just give more of his money to all of them? There can't be that many that his money wouldn't make a significant difference in their salaries. I I don't know. I, I never crunch the numbers, but that's how I see it. Yeah, it would not be a big deal for him to pay his employees more. Absolutely. That is, and pay that himself is less the case. his employees more. Yeah. Yeah. And he would not notice how much less he makes. His numbers right now are fully theoretical. Like he, nobody right. understands what that is. Right. He can't spend that money. His kids can't spend that money. It is it is in the realm of theoretical math at this point. Well, it is fascinating, though, to see his ex. What's her name? 
actually give that McKenzie? money away. Yeah. Is that McKenzie? Yeah, giving yeah. the money away. I mean, it, it, it does. It's exist. great. Yeah. It's wonderful. I, I mean, there are there are definitely uh, philanthropic wealthy people, and that is wonderful, and we should applaud that. I think that's always great. Oh, no, I wasn't de- defending. Yeah, we can't, like, assume that's going to happen. No, and we I'm can't not defending depend on that. Ph- uh, philanthropy. I know I, you're not. I'm sorry. I just have to say that. Anytime no, no, I, I just, no, but I, I, I wasn't. I'm just saying that that money is liquid. You can get your hands on that money, that Amazon cold cash, and give it out it's like you're when you say his money is theoretical i without unpacking oh, yeah, yeah. without unpacking it he could actually give that money to his employees yeah but when i say Evans, theoretical i simply mean the vast amounts of it are beyond what we can right, really right, even right, like right. get a comprehend so it was successful the the rally in new york you're happy it was with- very successful here was the completely an aside as i was running around times square it was like 90 degrees i had everything that i brought with me like in a backpack and I was carrying bags and I didn't realize that my small bag broke and I lost my wallet and, uh, it had like everything in it. And I was kind of stuck in New York with nothing for a day, which was rough, but a woman called me, she found my wallet and she mailed it to me with everything in it, which was like, wow, it was just so incredibly nice. And I have often felt like a lot of kindness in New York, you know, it gets a bad rap, but like this particular trip, I was really only there for 18 hours, but I saw so much tremendous kindness, which was really incredible. And then this final thing was just like, I kept feeling like I'm in a movie, like no one's going to believe me. This doesn't actually happen, but you know, it was just like a nice old lady too. That, I mean, I want to know everything about that, but has that ever happened to you before? Have you ever lost something of great value and have it returned? Have you ever found something of of, of good value, a phone, a wallet, jewelry, and, and returned it? I've never have found ever, anything. Have you ever no. found something and kept it? <laughs> I mean, you know, different episode. No, I've never found anything. <laughs> I, I think I found, I think the most I've found is like maybe a 5 or $10 bill on the ground. Huh. Like I've never, although I did find a 50000 one note, a South Korean one note on an airplane. What's that? That that was in my wallet. (laughs) So I didn't keep that because I didn't, I was like on an airplane. There was no one to give it to. That was, didn't come from anyone around me. It was like in the seat. How how did this person find you? She like went through my wallet. She couldn't find me, but she found that my mother was listed as a like emergency contact on my health insurance card. So she was able to find my mom, but my mom didn't answer. She like left my mom messages, which my mother has now come to find. And then she kept going. Like she, she spent three days trying to track me down and then found my ex-husband who was on my children's health insurance card and found him and like eventually got a hold of him and, and was able to get me. I, that's awesome. That is so great. How did that, what did that uh, do to your faith in humanity or the universe, at least temporarily? I don't, I don't know what question to ask, but how does that affect you? <laughs> well, so, you know, I had seen so many like nice things in the city. Like I, uh, I was just coming out of uh, a subway station and there were like a couple of like college kids who were just carrying up this wheelchair for what appeared to be a, a, a homeless man, like coming out like they and they were just like being really like nice about it too. Like mm-hmm. not just helping him, but just really like the the conversation that I was overhearing was really like heartwarming um, in general. And I saw lots of stuff like that. And so I was feeling really good. And then the moment my wallet was gone, I was just like, (sighs) you know, like I just totally, my whole worldview, I was like, yeah, sure. Okay, great. I thought it was all nice. And now like someone's going to take my identity and like, I just, everything shifted. And then a couple of days later, this woman calls me and I was just like, it it was that sort of, you were wrong to doubt that you should have believed all along. It was a whole movie I went through basically. Yeah, no, I'm interested in that. No, that's, that's God, losing your wallet is awful. It's like if someone woke up, if you woke up in the morning, you're going to lose your wallet today and it's going to have a, you know, all these things in it. And, um, you would, it's, it's, it's really stressful. You don't plan for that thing. It's a, you know, you're walking around without all of this important information. And now, like you just said, you're now you're worried that this is going to become maybe a years long saga. Someone stealing. Oh, your yeah. ide- no, I, I saw my future. I was like, yeah. okay, this is the next 30 <laughs> to 40 years of my life. I'm going to like try and like apply for a loan. And they're going to be like, you're that Mara. No, you're wanted <laughs> in like another country. And I'll be like, no, that's not me. I've been through that. Like it's, I just was like, Oh God, this is going to be everything forever now. So it's funny. Cause while you were going through that, I was having sympathy just because I saw you post on Twitter, a picture of you. This was literally my, um, <laughs> My thought process. I saw you post a picture of you promoting that you were there doing the doing the rally. 
um, with your mask on. And what I said was, oh, my gosh, that's right. More is in New York City. And I'm home, of course. And I go and it's like 95 degrees. Oh God, I was just terrible. doing this rally and I immediately was like feeling bad for you because I was like, I can't even get work done when it's that hot. I have such a hard time focusing. And you were like out there in full clothes in the cement city and a mask. And I was like, oh, was that brutal? Did it you? was. Yeah. <laughs> it really was. Mm. And, you know, that was the like I, I went into a McDonald's, really. That was the only thing I could find that had Wi-Fi after I lost my wallet. So I could sit somewhere and try and like cancel mm. any cards that I had. But it was just it was just so nice to be in air conditioning. <laughs> there was like a relief to that. And the woman sent you in the mail. She posted it. Yeah. I, she, yeah. She called me and like she she sent it FedEx like signature to make sure that it only got to me. I mean, she was very worried. She was she was hilarious. I mean, she just was like this, like stereotypical New York, like accent, you know, going to, her. I mean, like she's yelling to her husband in the background too. Cause she's like, I, maybe I could FedEx it to you. <laughs> and she's like, where's the FedEx? And he's, you know, he's in the background. I can hear like, uh-huh. it's where the old bagel place used to be. It's oh, over by awesome. Betty's like ridiculous. Oh, that's, that's great. That's great. It was amazing. I love that. That's a great story. I'm glad that you shared that one. Um, and let's stick, let's go even more personal and ask you what the hell is behind these tweets. It's time to go <laughs> behind Mora's tweets. Everybody loves following you on Twitter. A massive follow on Twitter. She's an amazing writer, and she's really good at shrinking it down to, what is it, 200? How many characters? Uh, I don't and, know anymore. And you tweeted uh, about your fake eyelash, about ostensibly your fake eyelashes and beauty trends. And I don't know if, if I read these, if they'll come off as well, but you wrote <laughs> person. So you just peel off the fake eyelashes and attach them easily to the natural line of your eyelid. Me looking like a swarm of caterpillars just crawling into one eye and the others growing an extra wing for takeoff. Oh, really? Oh, do you just peel them off and attach them? So then you make a comment just about beauty, but uh, which was the best part of new beauty trends that each one gives me the opportunity to pay attention to a different part of my body. I generally took for granted and really dig into how it's wrong. Oh, Mora. Oh, <laughs> it's what you, true. What's going on? I love it's this. It's true. hilarious and also I, self-deprecating. Everywhere I go now, like I, women are, you know, wearing these like really impressive fake eyelashes. And every so often I'm like, oh, well, you know what? I could try that. It would look good on me. And I like I try them every time. I, I guess there's something wrong with my eyelids. Like they don't they don't go on in some way. And so I always end up having to like I, I can never get them to work. And so I'm just like, oh, this is supposed to be really simple and they don't work at all on me. And I feel that way with just about every beauty trend that comes along. And <laughs> it's a problem because I'm like, like for the most part, I have spent most of my time just being like, I don't have to engage in that. Like I got over it when I was a teenager. I'm not, you know, most of this stuff isn't going to work on me, but now I'm like slowly getting to a place too of like, Ooh, like I'm looking older, which is fine. And I'm fine with that. I'm okay. I am at peace with that. Except I mean, maybe there's something I could do just like a little something that I could do. And I keep trying and it's uh it's not working out so great for me, but I'm also getting a little more like, like I'm getting a little more experimental in the like things that I hear about thinking, Oh, I should try that. I guess maybe. Well, it sounds like you are at times really comfortable and accepting of whatever your fate is as you there age. And you are can, definitely times. And and you convince yourself that this is whatever, you know, you, you do, whatever the chatter is that we should have <laughs> about our physical, you know, whatever. And then all of a sudden you're like, but maybe setbacks. And I I'm, I mean, I would imagine that's the most normal thing. I do think if we're going to generalize, it's different for men. I wonder about that. Well, I mean, like, I, here's why. Like. I don't think about my eyelashes and I've never noticed another man's eyelashes or thought about them. Sometimes my wife will make my wife's an eyelash person. I, I don't know. Are people, I, is it a girl I thing? I don't know, but I never noticed like things. There's so many more things to think about. There's so many more things that are being sold that are being manufactured that are being designed. I think for women to give you the options, but like, I just, I don't know. I mean, I am, not maybe a great example. I don't know. I'm bald. So I don't have a hair <laughs> issue because I don't, I'm bald. And like I, so I use soap and I, and a toothbrush and oh, not even. Shut up. Ra- You're so annoying. No, but like, Come I don't on. think. You I, use some special bald person cream or something. Don't you? Peop- 
first of all, first of all, I just, it definitely, cream? I don't know. It definitely irked me when you said to bald person, like we were a special category that <laughs> definitely got me. Oh, that's obviously there that you are a man and not like subject to the beauty whims of the industry because we're all categories. We're all just categories. It's just like, no type doubt, of hair I mean, and the like. Yeah, it's but just, I mean, like, I do hear, I do listen, especially for some now doing like reading ads. Like, I do hear the ad for like manscaping a lot, like shaving your or taking care of yeah. your your balls, like keeping them dry, and all those ad products and stuff. And I, are there products to keep your balls dry? There's a product to. Um, I'm that, so happy about that. Go on. That fights like swamp ass. Okay. All and, right. And um, yeah, Sam Cedar sells it on the show. I've heard him from, I forget what it's called. We have been sold like douches for so long and been told that, you know, like that crotch region has to like look and smell a certain way. And we've been told that we have to like go in and have people rip the hair out. That's just the mere idea that men might be told that like, mm, you should deal with your balls. Here's a product. Like it's just, it's, it's sort of equalizing. It makes me feel a little better. Well, yeah, that's an, that's another good, a really probably the best kind of everyday kind of affordable example of women waxing. Look, let's not, let's be clear. Obviously a lot of men do these things too. And women do or don't, I mean, I'm generalizing, yes, but, but, you're generalizing directly, but, but that's our- but of like my 15 guy friends that I'm thinking of close to none of them wax uh, their balls or their anus or their, or their anything that, and we, and I would know because these are definitely the types of stupid <laughs> like, things. Cause I look all the time, every, if every they time did, I see if, them. If like, they did, I would want to see it. Like I've seen well manicured guys in porn. Like I see guys who do, but I don't but think are you asking your friends. Are you just like, yeah, Hey, yes. let me see. Let me see your balls. No. How you doing? What's been up? It's your balls. I don't. (laughs) No. (laughs) We usually focus on the cock, but and that we nobody really talks about the balls because it's not as funny and there's not as much there. But no, we would talk about it in a text chain for sure. Like we would talk. Yeah, we were very like childish about dicks and stuff still at 45. So I would. But nobody's doing that. I'm saying like guys don't wax their balls as much as it's very common for women. And I don't want to reveal. Unfortunately, yeah. uh, What I know about people close to me, but um, it's happening. It's happening everywhere is all I'm saying. At (laughs) at all ages. I I may have occasionally gone into a place and paid a woman money to cause me severe pain by pouring hot wax on my lower regions. Right. And that's right. So all of this is a constant drumbeat of buy this look this what's your relationship I'll, I'll move off this and we'll get on a couple other things but what is your relationship with like makeup I feel like you don't wear a lot of makeup I don't I don't wear a lot and I don't in general I don't wear a lot of makeup I don't I try not to get like really obsessive uh, about any of this if you saw me well, you can see me but the rest can't I, my hair looks like you know like I was out in the rain like I don't I don't spend too much time worrying primarily because if I, I think if I like threw myself into that, I, it would be like the way, um, the way sometimes I can't write because I want the words to be perfect. And so I can't get the perfect words. So I can't write anything. And I feel like if I went down this path, it would just be like, I would live in a basement and I would never, ever emerge because it doesn't, it's not right. It doesn't look right. It's the, the hair is off and the, it, it's too much and I can't deal with it. So I kind of try to shut it down and avoid mirrors or reflective surfaces of any sort, basically. <laughs> like I just no. go through my day, like being like, ah, the sun is shining, which means you can see yourself in that window. So look away, yeah. just look the other way. Well, does it bother you then to do things like this on camera and you're looking at your face? It's, I hate it. Yeah. It's probably the worst thing about the pandemic is that like, okay, I took meetings, which already sucked. And now I have to stare at my own face during them. Right, this right, is right, the right. worst possible thing. Right. I never really, I didn't really think about that because I love to look at my face <laughs> so permission to be pretty sexist go for it i feel like you know i feel like women who are generally attractive and get a lot of attention most of their lives in addition of all the other probably great qualities they hopefully have to their physical beauty people make comments you know you know and 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 you identify it you can't help but identify as you know an attractive person you get used to that and it becomes kind of something that you you know that you use. It's it's powerful in a way. And and then if that is fading, then that part of your identity is fading along with it and you're losing that power. It's something I feel like a lot of women have been very open about, especially women that are on camera, on news or, or actresses and stuff where that stuff is even more blatant. But 
I think they have more permission to do it. And, and women who aren't necessarily in those industries should have the same amount of permission to kind of talk about what their beauty means to them and how to identify how it defines them and how as that changes as you age. And again, I do feel like that's something that's more about women than than men. So. Well, I'll knock a little bit of the sexism off of your statement by certainly openly admitting that I have spoken to you personally about my own like concerns with aging as a woman. So you're, you know, you're, you're aware of that with me so you can set it up. I don't, um, I don't know that you necessarily go through the world speaking to everyone like that, but, um, we've had that conversation. So it's very, it's difficult for me in general. And I don't identify, like I don't go through the world thinking like I'm hot and I'm getting less hot. It's much more a feeling <laughs> of I'm, I look a certain way and I'm barely comfortable with it. Like I've spent my whole life desperately trying to just be okay with it and not like feel tremendously repulsed by what mm. I see. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm almost there. Like I'm almost at this point of acceptance and now I'm aging. And so now where I'm like, just barely hanging on to like, I'm barely accepting me at 20. And now I'm looking in the mirror being like, are those jowls? What the hell is happening here? <laughs> this is now I have to add that. Like, I'm not prepared for that at all. I was barely with like the way my hair fell. And now I've got to like deal with this whole other what's going on with my neck. Like it's very, <laughs> it's very upsetting. And it's, it's too much because I've been fighting for so long yeah. to just be comfortable. And now it's like, ha, 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 you thought you'd cleared it. Fuck you lady. Here's a bunch of gray hair. Dude, that is, if it weren't so personal and, and <laughs> tough, hilarious, but it's just so, it's very specific and I think that that's a wonderful thing that you just shared because I bet you there's a lot of people that are similar like I got to the place where I want to be in terms of acceptance and physical my physicality or whatever and how I feel about it and now you know things are making it harder and and gravity is uh, and time is doing it's 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 work and it's like well, I don't know I don't I don't know why I'm trying to recant what you said I just thought it was wonderful <laughs> what, I thought it was wonderful what you said because it's liberating I think and, I'm I'm fully now though like I'm I'm definitely in the stage where I am a complete mark like I go on Instagram and they're selling me like hey you rub this stone across your face like 10 times a day while you know saying this incantation and pouring a magic oil that was gotten from a volcano that existed <laughs> in ancient times we went we time traveled back to the, the Mesozoic <laughs> era and we got this oil and now when you rub it in your face it's going to actually reduce all of your lines and you're going to suddenly it's it's a dorian gray painting that we have created for you in a <laughs> okay what does it cost all right i mean <laughs> i could try it right like you never know one of these things has to be real right it's bad they know Wonderful. it's they know that, that was First of all, hilarious off the cuff. And second of all, they know they're sitting in a room going, the, there's a group of, of women in this age range that will buy this time traveling lava <laughs> stone. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I feel so cliche. Now I'm so interested in this and I want to belabor it just by having you make fun of maybe one or two more products that you either <laughs> have pulled the trigger on or are considering it. Well, look, I mean, it's I'm, also really hard for me not to say the things that my wife and daughters, you like, I just feel like that's not my, my, my story to tell, but I do see <laughs> some of this happening in, in my world, but go ahead. I mean, well, and we also just came out of a pandemic, right? Like, sure. so people who had the luxury and the privilege of still being employed through the pandemic no longer had, a, you know, a certain level of things to spend it on. Like those of us who had some expendable income already, we couldn't go to restaurants. Like I wasn't going out to a bar. That would have been a little bit. So like all of a sudden it was kind of like, oh, okay, I guess I have an extra 20 bucks here or an extra like 30 bucks here to waste on say TikTok leggings that are supposed to make your ass look good. Like, all right, I'll try. Sure. Uh, it turns out you had to have a really good ass to begin with. That's what I learned. <laughs> that, that seemed to be the key part. Well, of that. I have and seen, in fact, all of the products. I have seen that way. I'm not going to lie to you uh, uh, on the TikTok or the Instagram, the, the women's tights that have like the butt, like um, a line around it to make it almost look like that's your butt yeah. or the seam, a seam that may, I've seen those kinds of pants. They seem to be an optical illusion that may be effective. 
<laughs> these were like textured. I don't know. Oh, I, they were like supposed God. to have elastic or something in a certain way. At the same time, I, I mean, the fact that I'm even bothering because I've gone through so much of my life, like looking in the mirror and being like, wow, here are all the problems that I'm seeing reflected back at me. <laughs> and I've never had the time to turn around and think about what problems were happening behind me. <laughs> so this was like, this was a big deal for me to even be like, all right, like this, you haven't figured out the front, but sure. Well, try, sounds, just try on the back. Part. It sounds like if we're going back to what you said, you literally, you had accepted the front and you were feeling really good about that. <laughs> oh no. And you're like, accepted- you know what? Let's it move wasn't... to the back and see if we can work with that. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait a second. Is that a gray? What the fuck? No, it's it's not that I was feeling really good about it. It's more kind of like when you go to clean your house and you think you're going to start with your kitchen and you like you start and you're just like, there's too much to do here. The bathroom is smaller. I will start over there because I will never get through all of this. It was kind of like that. It was just like, ah, uh, there's too much on the front and. But the behind, what is it? It's just the ass, right? Like, that's one thing. I can focus on one thing. No, I couldn't. Didn't work. Oh, Mar, that's really, really funny and honest, and I appreciate it. Um, all right. <laughs> Before I let you go, I want to ask you about, I like to talk with you about culture stories. Uh, in this case, these are kind of two, I guess, entertainment Hollywood stories, but they're, they're important and, and, and relevant to some extent. I, I think people, uh, it's fair to say. Um, the easier one less complex one has to do with actor Matt Damon, who I confess I'm a, I'm a real big fan of. Seems like a really oh, cool Damon head. Is that is there a thing? I don't know. I've just decided with this. It's oh, fun I, to say. Go on. <laughs> I, he's one of those guys. I absolutely want to hang out with and be friends with. Um, and he's famously father of, uh, of three daughters. He's married and he revealed that uh, during a recent meal with his family, he used the, quote, most taboo term for gay people, he said this in an interview to the British Sunday Times, uh, the most taboo term for gay people is much to the dismay of one of his daughters. And his daughter got up from the dinner table and and like left and yelled at him and wrote a whole diatribe. And, and um, he has since said in this interview, he's he's retiring the F word. And a lot, the criticism, of course, is, dude, you're 50. It's 2021. Right. And um, and I'm less like that. My friend Trayvon Free wrote on Twitter, a comedian, writer, Academy Award winner himself. He wrote, so Matt Damon just figured out months ago by way of treaties from a child that he's not supposed to use the word, that word. Um, and I just, I don't know, more I'm, I'm forgiving. I'm like, uh, whenever you wake up, I'm fine with it. Welcome to the party, dude. But you're, I, I imagine you're going to be more ruthless or less forgiving. I don't know. No, I'm not actually. Oh, and I think oh. that's a really good attitude. I, I, I agree. I think that's a good place to be. Like whenever, whenever you, you get there, we're happy that you got there kind of thing. I, I mean, I don't know, I guess my experience too, having had relationships with men about that age is that that word in particular, it's like, because it meant something so different to so many men as in the context of their childhoods. And they used it at certain cultures of men used it in ways that no way referred to gay people. There's like, I I've noticed a stronger fight to let go of that word. Now of the people that I've known, they have let go of it, but like I've had to be the one going through, like it's, you can't use that word and having to have those fights with with men. I mean, I haven't had to have one in a little while, but like, I'm, I guess I'm just not surprised that there are still men of that age who are still just now waking up to it, especially individuals who, you know, are not super online and are not like, like, I'm guessing he wasn't going around saying this word all the time. Right. And so he wasn't getting that pushback. And so here was an opportunity for him to get that pushback. But I mean, maybe he was, I don't know, maybe it's a piece of shit. I, I really don't know, but how dare you? I, I'm sorry. I don't know. My I just boy. don't know. I mean, maybe just maybe just him and Affleck were using it, but apparently yeah. also he said like this is a weird thing from the interview. Who knows how true this is? But apparently he said, "Come on, it's a joke." I say it in the movie "Stuck on You." He said to his daughter. So is Matt Damon is, uh, saying in a conversation with his own family member, referencing his his own work? That seems kind of that gave me the douche chills. I say it in. Oh, I come on. I did that in Goodwill Hunting. Stop. I was in the great I in the Great Wall. I know this because I was in the whatever that Great Wall movie Can was. Can you imagine saying that about anything you have done? I mean, you've performed so many times. Like, do you remember everything you have said? Like, to be like, oh, I said that in 1999 at the Ha Ha Hut and like like 
<laughs> no, that's absurd. Uh, yeah, no, I, it just seems like a very weird conversation to be having. To be fair, I don't have a body of work like films to, to easily reference and roles. But I mean, the guy does have a massive body. We're also this week. More controversy for Matt Damon. I don't know if you heard about this, but Amanda Knox, the American student mm-hmm. who, you know, her whole story, who was accused of murder in Italy and was in prison for it, wrongly accused and so on. Uh, Matt Damon's movie is loosely based on her life. And she wrote a whole Twitter diatribe as well as an article in The Atlantic saying, when do I get to own my own face, my own story, you know, my own image? And it was really interesting. But more importantly, more as she basically, you know, gave an education on how we should talk about things. It shouldn't be the the Lewinsky scandal, Lewin, right. the Lewinsky affair. It should be the Clinton affair. It shouldn't be the Amanda Knox story. It should be the story of, I think her name is uh, Kirchner, the girl who was actually murdered. It should be her story mm-hmm. or, the, or the murder. So I thought that was interesting. I don't know if you heard about that or care about that or thought about that. But yeah, I did. I mean, I, I it's it's very upsetting how many people have been we have sort of trapped in these unfair roles because of narratives that were created many, many years ago and that continue to be perpetrated. Um, it's it just if you sort of personalize it and you think about what it must be like, it's terrible. It's it's really awful. So I, I'm glad that she was able to sort of give voice to that. And I hope that, you know, people pay attention. I'm just mad that that's a story I read like an hour about to prepare to be on MSNBC and that they didn't use that story. I was like, oh. Really? We're not even, I didn't even, that was the one I would have passed on, Manda Knox. Did uh, they ask you about the TikTok leggings? Uh, that would have been more, a lot more <laughs> interesting to me to prepare, uh, prepare for, and more uh, important to me. No, that's terrible. I'm, I'm being to Amanda Knox. All right, so finally, um, you told me about this one. I don't even, I didn't even know about this, but there's a new movie being made, uh, and it's like directed by and starring the children of some of the most famous people in Hollywood, including Sean Penn's kid and Spielberg's kid. And the controversy around it basically is that actor Ben Stiller, I mean, it was being mocked, right? For yeah. even existing that all these super famous people are working together. They're the the kids of famous people. And Ben Stiller uh, apparently tried to uh, get in the mix and, and weigh in saying that nepotism isn't really a thing in Hollywood and that Hollywood is a meritocracy. Um, wh- why I love is, that so much. How did it's I do? So just, how did I do setting this up? I think I could have set it. I should have let you set it up, but no, I, I think you did just fine. It's so. I mean, like you're Ben Stiller. Like we know that that's not a name that that we haven't heard before. Stiller. There's. It's come from some places. There. There might be some other people who bear that name. Like it's really quite a position to take when you are the product of nepotism in an industry to say no, no, it doesn't exist. Like. I think probably where at least I don't know if it's Ben's position, but I've heard other people take this position where it's sort of a, yeah, but if the movie's no good, no one will care. No one will see it completely missing the fact that the movie's getting made and that, yeah, okay, fine. Maybe some work, if it's not good, is is going to get shut out in some way, but you're still completely ignoring the fact that many other people could never even get in the door and they were allowed to get in the door at all. And so like, that's where it starts. So yeah, I'm sure there are some moments in which a meritocracy occurs, individual moments, but when you don't recognize the tremendous privilege you have that affords you opportunities that other people will never, ever have for very, like so many reasons that, and those people who do not get those opportunities, you know, there are at least some of them who are probably far more talented and more, you know, worthy of those roles than than you are. That's that's a key component to recognizing what's happening here. And he's just blind to it. But more, I think it's so much more important than the entertainment industry. It's true of where you grew up and where I grew up and my first job and that my all of the things that my dad set me up with as well as got me out of. And, uh, you know, and that my family network, you you know, your family network, whoever your parents are, it, it means something. I mean, granted, my dad's, you know, the first job my dad got me was painting his friend's house, but he got me that job. And that's at one level. And then there's you're in a movie on the next level or you're going into this college, you're a legacy on that level, whatever it is. It's acknowledging the privilege that you start with, as opposed to somebody who's completely underprivileged, maybe born into poverty, congenital issue, maybe uh, you know, uh, an orphan who knows and just recognizing the difference between kind of where you start and who, you know, and why that matters. Yeah, 
Yeah. And I mean, in my personal situation, like my family did not get me any jobs. I, you know, went in and applied to be a waitress. But I come from a place where I knew that no matter what happened in my life, if I completely bottomed out, I could go back to my parents' house. Like There's they that. would take me in. They had the ability to do so. And beyond that, I wasn't in a place where I had to take care of them, where I was, you know, in such a, a, a situation that I was actually um, responsible for other family members in that way. I only had to care about myself until I had kids like that alone is a huge privilege a that point. other people don't have. So, I mean, like wherever you're you are in that, it's important to recognize how there are elements even when it feels like, well, nobody gave me anything like, yeah, but <laughs> I still had opportunities that other people could not take because of their situations and their circumstances. So well said. All right. Final question, which is just about COVID this week as we head into it. The uh, the headlines here on Sunday night, Florida reports new single day COVID-19 infection record. Other states like Arkansas and Missouri have been spiking, too. That's the bad news. The good news is we're also seeing uh, a whole bunch of people getting vaccinated for consecutive days of 700,000 COVID-19 shots in arms. And that's uh, that's a good change because it had obviously stagnated. How are you looking at this here in the beginning of August in your life I'm where you live and for the country? Terrified, frankly. Like, I mean, I think because I was one of the people who sort of, you know, I got the vaccine. Other people around me were getting the vaccine. And I had this moment of like, all right, OK, like we're going to. We're going to get through this. And so now there is definitely a feeling of like, oh, shoot, are we? And uh, and I'm seeing people cancel events, you know, that they were starting to put together, like baby showers and weddings and things that we thought we were going to be able to do. And people are canceling. And I had planned some trips that now I'm feeling like, uh, do I get on that plane? Do I, you know, and it's it's very discouraging. Um, you know, it's great to hear about more people getting vaccine, but there's such a large contingent of people who are so obstinate in this particular issue that I don't, um, I'm not excited. I don't feel great about it right now. I know. I just had a, um, we were invited to a gender reveal party that just got canceled. Really? Nope. I was going to say, did they blow it up? Nope. Mm. No, I've never been. <laughs> it really is the, the question. <laughs> Is it going to be dangerous? I've never been. No, I've never been invited to a gender reveal party. And maybe, I think I mean, that means you have good friends. Maybe. Yeah, they're they're terrible for our right. There's not, is there anything good about a? What if it's like a harmless gender? You cut into a cake um, and it's blue or, or pink or. I don't I don't know. I don't I mean, like I'm actually historically I have taken the stance of like if people want to celebrate something that is like joyful, they should celebrate there it. And we shouldn't mock okay. like people's. Right taking the opportunity. There's so few opportunities sure. to be happy, like go ahead, run with it. And so I do tend to have that place, but uh, gender reveals make me a little, uh, I don't know. Sure. I got to think about that. Well, I appreciate that perspective and all of your perspectives. And it's a great way to start our week or end your week. However you look at, at Mondays or Sundays. <laughs> I wish it was ending my week. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, Thank how you, do you feel like, like if we're going to continue talk, like I, I, what do you get Mondays? Is it weekends matter? And, and Mondays always had, have you had a relationship with Mondays? Um, you know, I think I like, it was only in dating people that I learned about how some people have that Sunday night depression. Thing. Yeah. That's yeah, a thing. Yeah. Which I like, I kind of maybe felt, but I never had it as strong as other people. Yeah. And I think I even like maybe was kind of one of those jerks who was like, all right, yay, like start fresh. We, here we go. Like, like <laughs> almost like a morning person. And yeah. I, but like now it's much more like, ah, oh, God damn it. Another slogging. Oh, here we go again, which, you know, hopefully I'll get back to, to being the real annoying chipper person soon. Well, you're awesome uh, to talk to on a Sunday night. And I appreciate you joining me again. Another a great conversation. I'm really happy with it. And I hope that you are too. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, more on Mondays. Are you are you falling for Mara? Isn't she great? Isn't she so likable and and smart and funny? And I just I love talking to her. She's been a really good friend to me throughout the pandemic, and I have a lot of admiration for just the way that she sees things and puts things and pushes backs uh, on on things with me, and just is hilarious. I thought that was very funny, and I'm psyched to have her joining me. Please go follow her and say hi to her. Tell her you, you, you love her on the show. It means a lot. At Behind Your Back. You guys are always so good at tweeting guests. Those of you that are on Twitter, those of you that aren't, you should feel terrible guilt that you're not uh, reaching out to those guests. Find a way to contact them and thank them. 
for joining me. All right. Also, uh, I caught up last week with Dr. Brian Rosenwald, who is a professor over at the University of Pennsylvania. He is an author as well. He's an expert on American history, communications, political science, media studies, public policy. And we had a great conversation talking about first the first 10, 15 minutes about sports and men and our relationship to it, which I thought was really interesting. And then he reacted to last week's testimony from the police officers on Capitol Hill, the insurrection and politics and looking forward, as well as how to motivate people a really interesting way to motivate people to get vaccinated. We covered a lot of ground. We caught up last Wednesday. So there's references, a couple of references to last week. But most of this is is all really relevant and important. A very thoughtful conversation with Dr. Brian Rosenwald. He's on Line, his website is Dr. Brian Rosenwald. You can follow him on Twitter at Brian ROS1, the number one at Brian ROS1. Definitely say hi to him there and get his book, which is fascinating and important. It's called Talk Radio's America, How an Industry Took Over a Political Party That Took Over the United States. Always fun talking with Brian. And we start with his obsession with the Olympics. This is an intervention of sorts. We're here to help Brian <laughs> cra- break his addiction to the worst entertaining, the least entertaining <laughs> events that he's literally waking up in the middle of the night to watch in the Olympics. You've got Olympics fever. Talk to me about it. Man, Pete, I, I've seen fencing. I've seen rugby. I've seen shooting. And you can't even see if they're hitting anything. It's just a puff of pink smoke. You think it's the Vatican and they're picking a new pope. Um, I, I mean, the, you name it, they have it on. There's like five channels live in the middle of the night. And the only thing I can't stand is the cycling. Like, OK, you're riding oh, your bike God. through the woods. Oh, I, I'm bored. that's the like, one. Well, you named events that that weren't as boring as you did before I hit record. You you have been, you've been watching synchronized swimming, di- di- synchronized-, well, no, synchronized diving. No. Now, now, Pete, let, let me explain what synchronized diving is. Please. Last night, the Americans won their first medal in it. And it is literally two people going up to a 10 meter platform, hurling themselves off this thing at 35 miles an hour, trying to be identical. Yeah. And then they have some you know, snooty analysts being like, well, they hit the water at a slightly yeah. different angle. Oh, I hate that. Uh, the judges are going to ding them for that. Or, oh, they jumped a different distance from the platform or their, their toes were like going in different directions. And you're like, what? I need to see that again. They did like eight twists in the air and didn't die like I would have. I mean, it, it, that like I agree with you about synchronized swimming. I, I that I can't watch. That's boring. Oh, I thought but you synchronized said synchronized diving. diving. I guess that's a little better. And I agree with you when the judge is just like, oh, that splash was just too much water. It's so pathetic. <laughs> yep. The, the judges you're are like. You're like, who are these people? Can yeah. they do this? Because I no. sure as heck can. No, it's just some fat shit sitting up there judging these. <laughs> uh, so, so, but are, are you, me? did you say you're, are you really waking? What did you wake up in the middle of the night for must see? I, I did not actually wake up. I stayed up. I watched the swimming and then the U.S. women's volleyball. And then I'm all, you know, excited and going. And I'm like, well, I'm still on the elliptical. I might as well see what's on. And it was like, oh, the Americans are in synchronized diving. Okay, I'll watch this. Because, like, the basketball game was on, but the Americans were up by, like, 25 points. So that's not that much fun. Um, I was not one of the ones. I know a lot of people who were up, got up at four to watch the the women's soccer team. Yeah. You know, the the Asian, you know, time zone for the Olympics is not good for us Americans at all. Yeah, how many hours ahead is Japan? I know Australia is, like, 16, 13, I think. So, I mean, the only thing that's really like it, the, the, it's OK at like nine o'clock at night and then the rest of the day is when we're sleeping. And then now, like it's the middle of the night, so there's nothing on that's live. Um, well, I mean, and I was you know, I was pissed last night, Pete, because one of my friends is in Britain and was watching on the BBC. And she's like, oh, you guys just want a surfing gold medal. And I'm like, why is it not on TV? I would like to watch surfing. Well, I'm pissed that your friend would say you guys just won. You did nothing. You did <laughs> nothing. They don't. The, the people who won it have no idea you exist. You, you you did nothing to participate or support that athlete. I, my friend, I've been said said the same thing. Also in Australia, our girl. He wrote, he said our girl beat your girl in the in the swimming. And I was like, I don't care. 
And so I wanted to ask you about that. I feel like you were tweeting about patriotism, and I've got a very unpopular take here. And it's you know, I've, I, and this is true of all sports, by the way. It's not just the Olympics and, and, and our national team. I don't really care who wins. I'm not rooting for anybody, and you will get me to root for the person who has the best profile. If Bob Costas does a tear-jerking profile on some swimmer <laughs> overcame, a, I'm rooting for the Tunisian girl over the American girl every time. I'm even more petty than that. Than that. I'll, I'll root for the person I think is more attractive at times. I don't understand the, the pride in one's nation, especially in America, where it's almost embarrassing that we're not better at, at, at sports like certainly basketball, <laughs> much less now women's soccer is suffering a little bit. I think it's because their politics, their politics are off. And so that's why they, that's what Trump said. Their wokeism is making them lose. But explain to me. Sorry for talking so much. Explain to me the, the, the patriotic responsibility that you feel. Well, I actually see it in, in two ways. I, I'm the opposite of you as a sports fan. I need a rooting interest to care about sports. Like I watch red zone on Sundays in the fall because I have fantasy football teams and therefore I have an interest. Otherwise I don't care. So I'm rooting for Philadelphia teams or in international competitions. I'm rooting for the Americans because that's my team. I, you know, and I've been doing it my whole life. I, you know, I will root for that person. Who's a good story, but after my players, after my team, and it's just because I need some reason. I need some reason to care. If it's just a good story, I don't care. Realistically, like, yeah, I hope that person wins, but I'm not invested in it. I'm not screaming, go, 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 as though me screaming at my television is going to have any effect whatsoever. I, I can't bring myself to be invested like that. Whereas with, you know, the American team, it, it's just a natural rooting interest. Like, I don't get it. You're right. Everything you say is right, but I, you know, I do get that patriotism. Look, I'm wearing red, white, and blue because it's the Olympics and, you know, it, it just kind of captures you. Okay, listen, I'm not, I just want to be clear. I'm not judging you and folks listening, I'm not saying it's wrong. Brian makes great points about having a stake in it. That's what makes it entertaining. I know people who obviously, you know, put a lot of money, they put bets on it to make it more interesting to watch, to care about one team or another. And, and I do want to be even more clear and transparent here, which is I, growing up, my, my dad really cared and still does care about Syracuse football and Yankees baseball and, and, and unfortunately Jets football. Mostly he cared Ooh, about wow. the, 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 the college stuff, but certainly the, the baseball stuff. And when they lost, it affected him, in my opinion, too much. I mean, it's not like he ever hit me. It's not like he was ever. It's just like an hour or two after the game, he would be like almost in a bad mood. And, and that bothered me because I loved watching stuff with my dad. I just didn't love how much it emotionally affected him. And now that's not to just call out my dad. I think most people are that way. And like I said, it wasn't like it didn't fracture my relationship. It didn't stop me from enjoying it. But I hated the emotional down, at least. I do like the emotional up when you win, I'll, I'll admit. But that's. I'm just giving a little bit more on my uh, vantage point. No, I think you're And I healthier. can't believe you're I, wearing, I can't believe you're actually wearing red, white, and blue because of them. that is really something. I mean, I like it's, you know, I, I think you are a healthier sports fan than I am. I am definitely that guy where I'm tweeting angry things about the Phillies. Then they hit a home run in the ninth inning. I'm like, delete, 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 you know. I am emotionally affected when my teams lose and I get into it. And, you know, I, I don't think that's healthy because like you can't control it. And there's enough bad shit in the world that you don't need more emotional bad shit that comes out of, you yes. know, athletes playing. I just like I was raised this way. I go back to 1993, October of 1993. I'm a 10 year old kid. Joe Carter wins the World Series for the Blue Jays. My Phillies lose. I run upstairs and crying, start tearing up my Mitch Williams baseball cards. Like <laughs> I was, I, I was just raised this way. You know that that playoffs. I fell asleep, face planted, 10 year old kid at like one o'clock in the morning in a cheesesteak after they won a game in the National League Championship <laughs> Series. That was that. Were you hammered? I just, the, <laughs> I, I mean, I think when you're up at one and you're 10, you're yeah. pretty much hammered. <laughs> yeah, that's um, a great point. But like, I mean, I, I I have been this kind of sports fan my whole life. And, and I don't totally get not being invested if I'm going to watch, which is why, like, yeah, I'll flip on a, a game where I don't have a rooting interest. Or they've had Olympic events that 
It's like, I don't hate this team. I don't hate that team. I don't love this team. I don't love that team. I'm like, well, what do I do with this? Do you, what do, am I going for? You make a lot of really interesting points. And, and but that's I think that the one that resonated the most with me is that the, it's stress. It can stress you out. And to me, like and you said, there's already so much in the world. Certainly our work is kind of covering the trends and, and the crazy things happening in the world. And and that can be stressful enough. So for me, as you know, I love gardening. That's my side gig. That's my hustle because it brings me peace. And certainly that can be stressful if things you planted died or, or, or you cut your finger or other, you know, anything can happen. But it's different It's it, than, than sports, which does did cause me and my dad and like sadness, anxiety, pain, the, the, what you're describing. And so it's it's hard to have that in your in your free time, in your interest time to also be stressed or be emotionally upset about a sport when you have so many real life things to be emotionally upset by. Absolutely. You know. I mean, that is the, the catch 22 for me with sports. When it goes well, it can wipe out that bad day right. that you had. But if it goes poorly, it, it just adds to it. You're like, oh, my God, even the sports gods hate me, you know, it, and it can wipe you out. So I, I think that you have a much healthier life outlook than not just me, but like everyone in Philadelphia. I mean, we're diehards for a city uh, whose four teams have won two championships in my 38 years of life. That means most yeah. seasons end yeah. in sadness. Yes. Yeah. That's too much for me. That's sadness. It's real, too. That is real sadness. And it certainly affects the community, win or loss, for sure. And and, and that, I guess that's just too much for me. It's like, we have so many other real, real things that are creating it. But at the same time, it does create a, a sense of unity and pride when you win. Although increasingly you see like stupid violence after a win. You, you see stupid violence. And, and I'll tell you the one thing that has bothered me the most. You mentioned patriotism. And I am I, I find it kind of disgusting how some of these people on the right are rooting against the women's soccer team. Mm. They're rooting against other American athletes, because, first of all, they fundamentally don't seem to understand what patriotism is. If you love a country, you want it to be the best it can be. And that means sometimes protesting. It means tough love. It means saying we can be better. And then to call these these athletes anti-American or un-American or unpatriotic fundamentally misunderstands that we have First Amendment rights for a reason. And speaking out to make your country better doesn't mean you don't love it. You know, it's like, do, do you not like your house if you renovate it and, and try to make it better? <laughs> no, I you know, know. I, I, you're making really good points. I'm trying to look up the Mike Pompeo tweet about history being taught and it's this idea of patriotic history, I think Trump called it. And this, you know, you make the analogies are perfect, whether it's the one you use about improving your home, your relationship, yourself. You know, you're on the uh, elliptical watching synchronized diving. Fine. You're also improving your health. That's great to exercise. Right. It's it's all true, but they don't. I guess that that point of view does not want to hear anything critical of of their of their nation or of themselves maybe even don't tell me what to do yeah. is, is something you hear a lot too it, it's just mind-boggling because first of all we don't own the sins of the past i mean you know, it's not mm. like you or i was there and did this so it's not like someone is criticizing you and saying oh pete this was all on you a hundred years before you were born right um and i i just i can't you know, I I don't don't get me wrong. I don't get people who have gone totally in the other direction who are like Abraham Lincoln, bad guy because he was a racist. I'm like, you know, you really shouldn't judge someone that way from the mid 19th century because you have to understand the culture they were in. But I, I just don't get not wanting to acknowledge and understand these things and not wanting to make our society better. And we can debate about what the policy you know, ramifications ought to be today and how we ought to address these issues. But understanding them is not like hating America. Understanding that our history includes a lot of good and a lot of bad is not bad. Like it, it just makes you smarter and makes you understand things. And like I don't get the people who who think America is so awful, but I also don't get the people who are like, "Don't you dare tell me one bad thing." Can't hear anything bad, or, or I'm going to get mad at you, and you're not patriotic. And, and it just it drives me crazy because. It does not seem to me as though th this should be that controversial to say, look, we were not perfect in the past. 
We did some things that didn't live up to our ideals, and we need to try to understand that, acknowledge it, fix it. It shouldn't be that controversial, because as you say, we're all into this on an individual level. I mean, think about it. You go back 40 or 50 years, and a lot more people smoked. I mean, like, we're always trying to make ourselves better. We exercise way more than, you know, our parents' generation or our grandparents' generation did. So if we can do it at a personal level, why not do it at a national level? I, I disagree with nothing you said, and I, I, I find it so hard. I don't know. I do like having conversations. Increasingly, I've been trying to, Brian, with, with people who, who believe what we're talking about, to work them into the conversation and try to help to try to understand where they're coming from. But it's 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 very difficult to be patient with this kind of mentality, which brings me to I want to ask you about the 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 select committee hearings on the insurrection. We heard from these police officers. I know you didn't see a lot of it because you were watching what were you watching? Fencing, maybe. And your priorities are completely. But I watched a lot of it. I punched in and out and I had tears rolling down my face. It was so emotional and so much was being made of the fact that there are Republicans in Congress, you know, who were not on that committee. Of course, Kinzinger and Liz Cheney were were terrible for not being there and for for doing what they were doing to now blame Nancy Pelosi for not providing the protection. We heard from the number three in charge, the former number three, of course, Liz Cheney is on the committee. You know, where do we go from here with this investigation? Does anybody's mind change as a result or is just just really important, obviously, to do and to keep in, in front of people. I have been baffled by some of the reporters who are saying, well, Nancy Pelosi made this big mistake by not taking the Republican selections for this committee because, you know, that that's going to rule out any chance that the, the Trump loving half of the country is going to come around on this. They were never coming around, Pete. They right. they're, they're living in an alternative reality. I mean, for Elise Stefanik to get up there and say, well, it, it's Nancy Pelosi's fault. First of all, it ignores the fact that they attacked the Senate side, too. And Mitch McConnell runs the when it was running the Senate then. So, you know, it wasn't like it, this is a partisan thing. And it's just unbelievable. You listen to some of the, the, the especially the far right wing in Congress, the, the Paul Gosers and, uh, you know, people like Marjorie Taylor Greens, people yeah. like that who are trying to, like, rehab these people. Oh, it was all peaceful and fun. Well, the, these police officers got up there and testified about their injuries and what happened to them. And, I mean, it, it's crazy for me because all I hear from Republicans is back the blue. And we're pro-cop and you Democrats are so terrible. Right. You don't like the police and you want to do all this bad stuff. And now here we are, police officers doing their job, defending our capital. There's nothing more patriotic than that. There's nothing more you know, sacred than that. But, but you understand that you wrote the book about this and what you're, you're pointing yeah. to is kind of a logical baseline of how can you be supportive of police officers? Then when you see police officers being beaten, making excuses about them, which we did, we did see. I mean, I saw Greg Kelly of Newsmax, at least one person today saying that the, the police officers there testifying were, you know, didn't, they were terrible. He was really critical of them and, and saying they shouldn't be police officers for their, the way they got emotional and, and ridiculous stuff. Now, that's just one guy on Newsmax. But the narrative is, is as you know, the only thing that matters. So it's not like, well, you, if you're going to support police, you have to support them over here and over there. It's a different narrative. It's anything that goes against what they're saying. They have to make up something. So all these pointing out hypocrisy doesn't even seem fun anymore is the point I'm trying no. to make, Brian. Because anything no, that I goes mean, against the narrative. Go ahead. Sorry. Th there are two problems here. They can't admit this and they can't admit what happened and they can't admit that it was an insurrection because if they do, then they have to admit who fomented that insurrection, who is responsible, who right. is still out there screaming about a stolen election. Like, uh, you know, I mean, he, he, that that would have been a stand up bit for you at some point, you know, a, an old guy screaming about something that is totally made up. That is like a, in his imagination and you can't even be funny about it now because he he's real and half the country loves this guy. And, and I mean, it's so dangerous and they can't admit that if they admit that this was an insurrection designed at overthrowing an election and our most sacred tradition, the peaceful transition of power, you lose and, and it's you know over. Then they have to admit that Trump is wrong, yeah. that Trump is the problem here and they don't want to do that. I mean, you know, and they keep doing the whataboutism of saying, 
well, you know, you Democrats in 2000 and 2004. And I'm like, yeah, but our candidates conceded. Our candidates got up and said, we lost. Mm. We lost Florida by like 500 votes. Right. Donald Trump, it, we're talking like 110,000 votes. He won't give it up. Al Gore got up there and said, yeah, the Supreme Court decided this. Yeah, I lost by 500 votes because some clerk down in Florida designed a ballot. So that all the Jews down in Florida, the, <laughs> yeah. my grandparents kind of people were voting for Pat Buchanan, which I don't know. I can't say much with certainty, but it's that they were not voting for Pat Buchanan. Like, that's why he lost. And he still got up there and conceded. That's always the that's always the one. The, there's a lot of points about 2000, but I'm glad that's the point you made about Jewish people voting for Buchanan, because that's always <laughs> one that there's still not an answer to that, I feel like. And, and, that, and that matters a lot. But, yes, yeah, so that, that's those are all great points about why they have to stick to the narrative, because if they don't, they have to come to they have to face the truth that Donald Trump who instigated this. And we know that because so many of them actually admitted that then, including Kevin McCarthy and Lindsey Graham. But so this, but I don't know if you answer my question. Do you think it changes any any minds? These hearings, which day one was really dramatic, Brian, which means it's going to get, as you know, and you know, write about a lot, a lot of play on television. I mean, it, what does it mean? Does anybody get their mind changed as a result of seeing police officers today or any other witnesses testifying? So I think it will be a few people at the margins. I think that there are always some, you know, there is a small pool of Americans that I think is probably right leaning, but more open minded, doesn't love Trump, but doesn't hate him, who might be swayed by this kind of thing, especially if they're pro law enforcement. And there might even be people who are police officers um, or their families who don't like this backlash against these guys for doing their jobs. But I think that there is a more important, if quieter, political effect, if, if less obvious political effect, which is the more Republicans go down this path, the more they are permanently alienating suburban voters, especially suburban women, the more that they are angering those people and encouraging them to turn out in 2022, the more that I think they are permanently losing young voters who are saying, well, this is bonkers. Don't tell me these people were heroes. They were breaking into the Capitol and assaulting police officers or worse and trying to overturn an election. So I think that what it's going to do, and I think that unfortunately, most of what happens in our politics today is does it get people fired up? And I think this is going to fire up the people who are anti-Trump in some way, shape or form. Um, and, and the other thing is, I mean, like, look, Kevin McCarthy's calling Liz Cheney a Pelosi Republican. And I had to laugh out loud. It was like the dumbest idea. You know, if that's the best you can do, quit, buddy. And, and you know, let's, let's, you know, there's got to be somebody more competent. I mean, to review for people, we're talking about someone whose father was Darth Vader to the left for eight years. We're talking about someone who was literally like, yeah, my sister's in a gay marriage, but I'm against gay marriage. And we're talking about like seven years ago, not 20 years ago. We're talking about someone who voted for Donald Trump last November. And I thought yeah. it was fun that, that the Democratic, one of the Democratic staffers pulled up some voting records. And I was like, so you guys know McCarthy voted with Pelosi more than Liz Cheney did, right? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see your face. Like, this is what this is who this is. This woman, I don't think I agree with her on anything substantive. Except what she's saying is this is dangerous. What happened was dangerous and we have to get to the bottom of it. And she's willing to throw her political career away to do what's right. And props to her because that, you know, not enough people in that party are willing to say, you know what? If I lose, I lose because this is what's right. And we need that in politics. If you're, you know, if you've got these people who are craven, who have changed their, their tone. I mean, I don't know if you saw there were a couple of profiles of Nancy Mace in the Times and the Atlantic last week. Nancy Mace is freshman congresswoman from Charleston, and she got a fair amount of attention when she first got to Congress because she was the first, I think it was the first graduate, female graduate of the Citadel or, or one of those, you know, the uh -huh. military institutes. And she's a single mother. I mean, the profile wouldn't necessarily sound like a Republican, former Waffle House waitress, which she brings up in every profile. <laughs> and then she came out in her first week in Congress and absolutely ripped the everlasting shit out of Trump over the insurrection. And then over like two months, she slowly backtracked to being like totally party line because she realized that the storm clouds for her politically 
were on the right, that she was going to get primary. And this is someone who beat a Democratic incumbent in a district that barely voted for Trump, moving towards the Democrats. Mm. We're talking about Charleston and like the South Carolina coast. And this is a young woman who, you know, she, she's had threats over different things and, you know, made a big deal about how she went out and bought like four guns over it and all the, you know, she, she's totally playing to the right now. And this is someone who was originally thinking she could be sort of the, the driver of the post Trump party. You know, she's younger. She supports some LGBTQ rights. She is more of an environmentalist because she represents the low country of South Carolina. And now she's like totally trying to say like, well, we don't need to talk about Trump. We need to talk about how awful Pelosi is and all this stuff. And it, it, it's such a great sign of how many of these people have sold their souls. And have basically said, well, you know, doing what's right is not going to be politically popular for us. So sorry, we can't do it. Yeah. Well, it's hard to it's hard to see, given that example. And I'm going to go look into that and and look up those profiles. I mean, when you say she's walked back and now is holding the party line, you mean the Trump party line? Well, I, I think she tries to avoid like being like, yay, Trump. But she's mostly, you know, she has not criticized anything or departed from the party on like anything in months. Right. And if you when when they're interviewing her, she's talking, you know, she came out like two weeks after she went all over, you know, was all over Trump. She came out and was like saying AOC was um, exaggerating her opinions like her office was down the hall. And she's like, we were never in any danger or anything like that. She picks fights with Democrats now. Oh. And she's doing that kind of thing to, like, bolster her profile. And it's a shame because I was thinking to myself her first two weeks in Congress, like, you know, this is someone who I probably don't agree with on everything, but we could go and sit and have a beer and find common ground. And this seems like someone we need in politics. And now it's just like if this person is afraid of Trump and this person is afraid of the primary electorate, the Republican Party really and truly is in you know, dire straits. I mean, I'm almost at the point where I say we need to push the plunger and start over and get a center right party of sane people. Well, we are at that point, but there is no plunger. That's right. Where, where's like the, the old Looney Tunes thing where, where we like, you know, have have the the guy sitting there with the plunger. There's no plunger, Bri. That's, that's what's scary is that they're going down these crazy roads and it's affecting, you know, school board meetings and, and, and local election committees. And uh, it's really, uh, that's why people have to get involved. I, I want to say every single show at the local level, I am more and, and we all need to. Let me ask you, though, about trying to tie this issue with the other big issue in Congress, which would be. The infrastructure bill are getting something done. The idea that there couldn't be a a true by well, it is a true bipartisan committee. I mean, you've got two Republicans on it, both very conservative, both voted a lot with Trump. At least Liz Cheney did, uh, you know. But you couldn't get in the Senate committee. You couldn't create the that committee because no Republicans were going to vote for that. They couldn't vote. They couldn't get together to vote for an investigation into a terrorist attack. And so how can they possibly get it together to pass a meaningful, important legislation that will impact people's lives in their own communities like the infrastructure bill, which I know that you've you've been following more? What what do you think the odds of of anything getting done? Well, so to to build off of what you said, two two important points. Yeah, we got seven of 50 Senate Republicans voted for a an independent commission to investigate a terrorist attack. The other 43 of them said, no, we, we, we don't want to do this. And that's a bad sign. And maybe the worst sign for the Republicans. I don't know if you saw this last night, but but Donald Trump endorsed Ken Paxton, the I did. I under saw. investigation Texas attorney general. And why your audience is thinking, why do we why do Pete and Brian care about this? Well, the answer is that his primary opponent is George P. Bush. Yeah. This is Jeb's son who has spent like the last two years kissing up to Donald Trump taking pictures with them, talking about how great he is after the guy ripped his parents and his grandparents. Like if you're, you you want to epitomize a sellout, you want to go and get your Merriam Webster's dictionary that has so much dust on it because the internet exists. that You haven't opened it in like 30 years and you look out, look up sellout. You're going to yeah. see a picture of this guy because like he literally was like, ah, eh, you ripped my parents. No big deal. I'll kiss up to you. And, and of course it, it went nowhere. He just humiliated himself. But so infrastructure bill. I actually think that this is both a really, really bad sign and a really, really good sign. What's happening in Congress. The really, really bad sign. You know, I want to 
save the positive stuff because we'll, we'll get the depressing stuff out of the way. Go ahead, yeah. But the, the depressing piece of this is infrastructure used to be easy, Pete. It used to be something where we all want better roads and bridges. We've all sat in traffic jams for no reason because the roads suck. We all want, you know, get rid of lead pipes and, and things like that. Like th this shouldn't be controversial broadband so that people in rural places have more economic opportunity rails, you know, ports. Th these are important things that make our lives better. They're in every community. Everybody benefits from infrastructure. It used to be the thing that Congress loved doing the most because they could all vote for it. And then when they finished the new bridge, they could sit there with those giant scissors and, and cut the ribbon <laughs> yeah, and open yeah. it up and say, it's all yeah. me. Or yeah. if they were, you know, the, the senior members, the appropriators, they could put their names on it. That, you know, it could be the Robert Byrd bridge that led to the Robert Byrd, like, you know, yeah. building or something. Like yeah. that. So it, this used to be easy. And now we're doing three or four weeks of this complicated dance of like, is it going to fall apart? Isn't it going to fall apart? Can they get 10 Republicans? Are they going to lose the Democrats because they don't want to vote for like transit funding or getting rid of lead pipes or any of this stuff? And it's depressing because. If, if Congress cannot do this, they literally pick the easiest issue yeah. to reach yeah. a bipartisan consensus, because no matter how conservative you are, you know, there, there have been all kinds of stories. There is this bridge from like Cincinnati, Ohio to the Kentucky side that is like falling apart and threatens to like throttle their economies and their commutes. Yeah, yeah, and, like, yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter how conservative your state is. You want this to pass. You want infrastructure. So if they can't do this. They can't do anything except maybe like, you know, naming a post office or something like that. You know, they there's so little that they can do. But here's the positive side. I think this is going to eventually get done. A bipartisan bill. And, and I'll, I'll be honest, I don't think the bipartisan bill is that great. I don't think it's that important, except as a symbol that, look, we can work together and get something done. And I think that if it happens, it could create some momentum for other areas. They're still talking. Cory Booker and Tim Scott are still talking about police reform. Uh, Kirsten Sinema and Mitt Romney are talking about increasing the minimum wage in some sort of compromise way. So there are some possibilities out there. But more importantly, this is going to unlock the opportunity to do a reconciliation bill. Theoretically, they're not linked, but for moderate Senate Democrats, they don't want another huge, massive party line bill to pass without having done something bipartisan, without having right. done something to show their constituents that they can work together. And this reconciliation bill, it, it sounds boring. Reconciliation bill, like $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill just sounds like an expensive, wh what is that? But what it really is, is because Congress doesn't function, because they can't legislate. Yeah, see, it's putting Pete to sleep, but I'm going to wake Pete up no, with, with exciting no, I'm, things. No, I'm, 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 in, I'm interested. My back hurt. I just shifted. I swear to God. I'm Go ahead. No, no, this um, is important. You know, so w w what this bill is going to be, it, it's going to be Democrats, basically their entire agenda. It's going to expand Medicare to have dental, vision, um, hearing. You know, things that you would think should be covered by insurance because they are literally your physical health. Um, it is going to continue the extra subsidies for people who get their um, health care on the Affordable Care Act um, exchanges. It's going yeah. to elder care, um, which is increasingly important as the boomers age paid family leave. It's got all kinds of things that are going to be good for Americans that Democrats have been fighting for for a long time. Um, and I actually I mean, I think they're getting treated unfairly by the media because the media keeps hyping three point five trillion, three point five trillion, which sounds like this massive number when in reality it's actually over 10 years. So it's it's a much smaller number each year that, that is not nearly as mind boggling or, or as threatening. But like these would be massive accomplishments when you consider that Democrats have the smallest possible majorities in yeah. both houses of Congress. And, and I mean, th there's other things they're talking about, letting Medicare negotiate the price of prescription drugs, which would bring prescription drug prices down dramatically for everybody. You know, th there's all kinds of provisions. We don't know exactly what's going to be in it yet. What, yeah, what they're going to take from the menu. And, and I've been working with the disability uh, community activists uh, about, you know, getting getting their needs met in the budget and, and getting disability SSI increased for people. And it hasn't yeah. been increased in, in years Yeah, That that's you're making great lists and great points about what government is actually supposed to do. You know, it's so easy to look at infrastructure and talk about the bridge and name the bridge. 
but elder care and child care and the child tax credit, which, of course, Republicans should be touting and taking credit for, because I think that was originally, you know, some conservative uh, think tank idea. But yet we're not maybe able to get any of it. We're certainly not able to get any Republican votes on it because government is, is so broken. But it's possible that a lot of it does get through, I think, is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I I think there's a chance that there's a big signing ceremony in the White at the White House at some point in the fall where we get this very big um, bill passed that that does a lot of great things and that really is a generational set of achievements. And the encouraging thing, this is something that I, I just wish that people understood. You hear a lot of of liberal activists who are just absolutely excoriating, whether it's cinema, whether it's mansion, well, they won't get rid of the filibuster. We're not going to pass our entire agenda. We're not going to do voting rights. We're not going to do D.C. statehood. You know, all the things we're not doing. But realistically, in one Congress with a very slim set of majorities, if you get elder care and child care and infrastructure and digital infrastructure and some climate mitigation measures and things This is wildly successful. This is actually achieving things that are going to make every American's life better, put more money in people's pockets. And this not only gives Democrats something to run on from a political standpoint and maybe a reason that excites people to turn out. So they build their majorities and can get to some of that other stuff. But, you know, when you get to 60, 70 percent of your agenda for either party, that's a massive achievement. Because we, you know, and I think people have lost sight of this, is that right or left, so many achievements in American politics have taken decades or a century or more to achieve of people working tirelessly to achieve them. If you get stuff done and you get stuff passed in two years with slim majorities, that's a big deal. And I I, I think that the activist base um, and the left would be wise to think about what they pass, not complain about what they don't pass or worry about what they don't pass, because this is a good thing. This is a sign of the process, you know, at least working a little bit, maybe just that much. Um, and, and a sign that, you know, if Democrats won even a little bit more um, in 2022, even you know, pick up two Senate seats and five House seats or something like that, which which is a big win in the context of a midterm with the Democratic president, but isn't big in terms of actual numbers. Like they could get to a lot more because we actually have a coherent agenda that most Democrats support. There are some on the left who say, oh, my God, you need to go so much further. You know, you can call them the Bernie Sandersites. There are some that are more like Joe Manchin. They're like, no, this goes too far. I'm, I'm pretty uncomfortable with this. But then you drill down and they agree on more than they disagree on. So, you know, I, I think that there is some reason for optimism it's maybe not perfect. I think the process is certainly showing that it's broken um, in some way, shape or form. And maybe the best example of that the thing that, that drives me the most nuts at this time of year is that all these artificial deadlines. Why? So Congress can go on a six week August vacation. Yeah. You know, yeah. They call it a district work period, which means yeah. they don't come to D.C. and you know, do what we're paying them well, to do. I, I mean, I, I do always like to push back and say they're not on vacation. They're in their districts working. They don't actually take that kind of vacation, but they're not doing actual. They're not voting. They're not in Congress right. voting. And so you and, and th- these bills, there's a, a huge sense of urgency. And I completely agree. The idea that that they could take off and have an August recess. I don't think, but you know, if people were pointing to in the past, McConnell didn't allow for that. He's like, no, we're going to stay here. Get another uh, <laughs> but you know, it would be a real shame to see, I think Chuck Schumer, and Nancy Pelosi, I'm not sure who gets to decide such things, but you also make a really good point. I think about like a lot of people are saying that if you, if you can get something done for the American people, and they notice that. And somehow if you can tie you being getting the credit for that, then that's a better way to get reelected. And when you see all these voter suppression bills and the idea that these voting, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the voting rights bills are having trouble getting you know passed because of the filibuster. It's it's if they're going to suppress the vote, if they're able to with these bills, the you know, on the flip side, if you get something done and people are less cynical about government actually getting something done, you might actually get more people out voting in general and not hating, uh, you know, entirely Congress and, and, and what they're doing. So it's a very small green shoot and silver lining. If we can, you know, get these voting rights bills passed, that would be most important. But still getting things done that you're talking about, all these things you're talking about, that would be huge. 
Yeah, I mean, look, Pete, I, I think these voter suppression bills are bad. I think that they are, are antithetical to American, you know, what should be American values. They yeah. are suppressing a fundamental right to vote, and they can't cite for you one actual legitimate reason why these provisions make anything any safer or any better. But what I know is true is that in almost every case, if Democrats want to vote, if they are willing to show up in 2022 and they're willing to say, you know, if I have to wait in line, I'm going to wait in line. If I have to go and fix my ballot, my mail ballot, because they've tried to reject it over my, like the loop in my signature not being the same or something like that. If they're willing to put the effort out, you can vote. Um, you know, Barack Obama has said that about these things and that if Democrats win more, if Democrats build their majority it's not going to take a whole heck of a lot of other seats to get rid of the filibuster or at least carve something right. out for voting rights and then actually to address this stuff. And realistically, you know, I, I go back to this thing of like, well, how how are they passing these voter suppression bills and doing this stuff? The conservative movement started taking off in the late 1950s, and they really were not able to do a lot of what they wanted to do until the last 10 years. And even yeah. then, there are still things they can't pass. It takes time. You have to be engaged and show up in every election. The thing that has hurt Democrats, why is the Supreme Court not protecting voting rights? I hate to say it, but the answer is turnout in 2010 and 2014 was abysmal. And Republicans captured all these Senate seats. And, and people might say, well, why does that matter? Well, it matters because if people had turned out at the levels they turned out in 2008 and 2012, then instead of Mitch McConnell being in charge of the Senate when Scalia dies, it would have been Harry Reid. And we would have had a Justice Merrick Garland. You would have had a left-leaning Supreme Court, not a right-leaning Supreme Court. And the whole game is different. So, I mean, I, I can't stress, you, you're talking about getting involved at a local level. Absolutely. My dad was a local elected official for nine years. And, and let me tell you, there's no more thankless job than our school board members, <laughs> yeah. our township commissioners. You know, you, you're standing yeah. at the deli counter trying to get cheese and people are telling you what a fool you are because yeah. they saw you on local access television and they don't like where you move their kids school bus stop or something. But, you know, <laughs> yes, get involved at the local level. But also make sure your friends, your family, people are engaged and are voting, that they don't exhale. The thing that scares me the most right now is that people say they exhale. They say we were like white knuckled for four years and yeah. Trump is gone. We got rid of him. We can go back to like caring a lot less about politics. If we do that, he's going to come back and more people like him are going to come back. We're in a situation, I, I think it's Jonathan Last of the Bulwark, uh, one of the conservative publications where he's a never Trumper, who has basically said, I don't care what the Democrats stand for. They stand for American democracy right now. So I'm on their side. And what he said is, you know, if you look at the demographics and this is more of an age thing than a race thing, younger voters, people under 45 hate where the Republicans are. Two thirds of them are Democrats and voting Democrat. So in 10 years, things might be pretty safe. But those next 10 years, the structural advantages Republicans have, they are going to be able to win so long as Democratic voters don't show up. And if Democratic voters show up, they can prevent this. So it's really important that people stay engaged um, and that they care, because if not, then they're sort of just opening the door to everything horrible again. You know, we just fought yeah. so hard to take things back. And you open that door and it's dangerous because there is no guarantee the, the right wing is an author, you know, authoritarian movement or party at this point. A lot yep. of them have sort of said, we don't care as much about democracy as we care about, like, imposing our vision right. for America, our cultural right. vision, which people. is Jesus, so, which is Jesus strapped in bullets, waving the American right. it's, flag. It's Jesus strapped in bullets, uh, waving the American flag. Um, pro family, but I'm not even sure what that means. Cause as you said, they didn't want to vote to expand the child tax credit. They, you know, they're against like breastfeeding mothers at the Olympics and things like that, or, or you, you name it, they seem to be against it. That at this point, they're probably against, you know, apple pie, I think. But a lot of them are against, a lot of them are against vaccines. There's a huge overlap with the evangelical right. You're seeing all these, these preachers who made their people crazy now not being able to control them when it comes to the getting them vaccinated so i came up with two solutions that would get rid of covid in like three months Either let's go let's number go. one and, and this one went viral all you gotta say to them everybody in the south is look 
if you don't hit 70% vaccination rates in your states, you don't get SEC football. That's the first thing. No, no Saban, no Auburn, no Tennessee. You, you don't get to do that. But you don't want to do that? Okay, you don't want to threaten them with football? Here's what you do. On Sunday at their churches, you have people giving shots out on the way in. You don't want to get a shot? That's fine. You're watching on the screen. You're not going in. You're not, you, you want to worship in person, get a shot because you're 100% right. It's these religious people who claim to be pro-family and pro-life who are keeping COVID alive in America. You look at the states with the lowest vaccination rates. It is literally the Republican belt in the the South, the Mountain yeah. West, the Plain States. And it is literally, I mean, you talk to the, you listen to these people. Did, did you hear about Phil Valentine? No. Phil Valentine is the most significant conservative talk radio host in Nashville. Oh, I, maybe I did. Yeah, go ahead. He's been around for decades and he was on the air telling people, you know, if you're young and healthy, you don't need a vaccine. And then he got COVID and he was bragging about how, you know, he was going to beat it off with vitamin D. And I forget what some of the other stuff he was going to take care of it with. And he's feeling better and he's telling people it's no big deal. And then later that week, he lands in the hospital with pneumonia from COVID and he's still in the hospital. And now his family, his brother is leading the charge for his family, like begging his listeners, please get vaccinated. And he said, you know, my brother is not anti-science. When he comes back on the air, he's going to tell you the same thing. But I mean, you see these cases over and over and over again, these conservatives who were anti-vaccine, either dying, getting sick. I mean, and, and like, look, I hate Sarah Huckabee Sanders. I hate Donald Trump. And she wrote this op-ed being like, get the Trump vaccine. And I'm like, you go, girl. That's right. Like, I th this shouldn't be a partisan issue. We should want every American to get vaccinated because that's the only way we beat this. And it's it's like science gave us this miracle gift that we can go back to regular life. And we're like, yeah, no, not so much. I mean, so it's, it's great. Point, great arguments about the SEC and the, and the church thing. Did you tweet those? I'll go share them. I, I did tweet those. Uh, the, the SEC thing went viral. And then the, there were a couple of blue checks who picked up on it and were like, you know, new variations. I mean, and, and look, I, I'm willing to let the, the anti-vaxxers go. If they can go to Nick Saban and say, coach, I'm not getting vaccinated. And here's why. And not die. That's fine. Because I, I'm pretty sure he just shoots laser beams out of his eyes. And it's like, no, you, you, you go get vaccinated right, right. now. Because his team is 90 percent vaccinated. Like. Saban's not screwing around, but I mean, you know, otherwise, and in all seriousness, you know, some of these things are obviously, you know, a, a little bit tongue in cheek because they're not, not really, not really you strike them at the things that they, they love that they yeah. need. And, you know, it, there's, there's ways around it, you know, necessarily mandates like you do not have to get vaccinated, but if you want to send your kid to this school is what it always was. That was never that controversial up until recently. No. But these ones are more creative when it comes to sports and all your other interests and hobbies, much less church. Well, I mean, the, the thing that I I think, and I can't take credit for this, I think my friend Michael Smirkanish has been talking about this. It doesn't make sense to say to vaccinated people, you have to wear masks again. You've already done things to prevent this, but you have to go right. do more. Well, we're not letting, well, we're letting these non-vaccinated people off the hook. Um, and, and I mean, realistically speaking, you're right. I remember in like the first grade being a little terrified kid in this long line at the pediatrician's office because they mandated a new shot that we had to get. I remember producing vaccination records to go to college 20 years ago because you couldn't go without them. This yeah. shouldn't be controversial. This is nothing new. And yet these people are fighting it tooth and nail. And look, I, I know that the conservative answer is that the va vaccination rates in minority communities are low as well. And that's true. But the solutions are a little bit different. The cultural outreach is a little bit different. And as a historian, I'd be remiss if I didn't note that some of that hesitancy is that they have a long, long history of the medical community using minority communities as right. guinea pigs and of mistreating them. So I think we need to go about get, winning them over in a different way. But I mean, I, I think in some of these conservative places, like they're overwhelming their hospitals. I saw one in Orlando this morning that said they're yeah. turning patients away. I mean, uh, it, it's nuts. It's nuts to be back there again when we yeah. have this vaccine and it, it's so dangerous. And the rest and of the world, the, the rest of the world that would that would certainly there's always an anti-vax movement, unfortunately, everywhere from Australia to Africa. But they're all, you know, looking at us at saying, you idiots, you've got the vaccine. We don't even have yeah. the vaccine. You have the vaccine and you're not taking it. It's just it's it, just it, crazy, which I is mean, why it's... which is why I root for the Aussies in the Olympics. <laughs>
Well, you, you would have liked it. The, the one Aussie woman who won the, the swimming event last night went on Australian TV and like, what do you want to say to your mom and your sister? It's been a rough time. And she's like, fuck yeah. And then she's like, oh my God, I can't believe I just cursed on like live oh. Australian television. Oh, I so, thought you were going to tell me she took that opportunity to say something political against the government about the vaccination. No, 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 no. She, she just swore. Uh, and I was like, you know what? I want to be friends with that person. Oh, you know, uh, but the, it, the, not too many Australians were bothered by it. All right, listen, I know that you have to go watch Equestrian yeah. Croquet. That, and that's so, right. <laughs> I, I, I want to see those horses jump and the people in the white water rapids. You know, it's only every four years that I'll care about these things, but, but I care. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's always great talking to you, Brian. Appreciate it. Always my pleasure, Pete. And there you have it. That is today's episode of Stand Up. You've got the news and two great guests and wide-ranging conversations. And that's what I'm trying to do every day here for you. And always interested in new ideas and how to develop the show and change the show and bring new people in and many voices at once and debates and interactions and live and, you know, all kinds of ideas that I've got that I want to emanate out of the shed. And I'd love to hear from you as well. So join me and my friends on Thursday nights at The Hangout. Sign up now and join us anytime on the Discord platform, Virtual Hangout Thursday night, Discord platform, which is text, voice, video, anytime you want. You're never alone if you're a member of this community. Please sign up now, patreon.com slash Pete Domino. We're going to the paid subscription link in the show notes. Support Pete Co. does the voiceover on the show at Pete Co. V O. Support John Carroll, who wrote the music at J D Carroll eighty eight. And please support all of my sponsors in the show notes as well. Write a review on Apple iTunes and get five stars. And you know what? That's it. I'm done talking. Take it away, John Carroll. Change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We gotta let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up Alright, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up 